Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, 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 yeah, check one, what, what. Mm, 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 boom. It's another episode of Let There Be Talk. What's up, everybody? <laughs> it is Monday, April 30th, and I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Did you have a good weekend? Hell yeah, you did, because you're still alive. <laughs> I'm assuming you are. If you're listening to this, yeah, you're still alive. How are you guys? Great guest today. Oh my God, I'm fired up. I am completely jacked up on today's guest. This is one of those dream guests that when people ask me, hey man, uh, who's your dream guest? Right here, right here today. Brad Wilk from Raids Against the Machine. Are you kidding me? He's never even done a podcast. He only started listening to him a few weeks ago. And uh, here, it happened grassroots. I hit him. Hey, you want to do my podcast? He says, yeah, I get lucky. He's actually the one operating his Instagram, not a corporation, not a manager, not an agent. Him, old school style, reaches out. And next thing you know, he's at my house over at the shitty thin walled apartment. And uh, we talk and we talk and we talk for hours. I'm all talking fast today. I'm all Ted Nugent stuff like, you got to, you, you got to, I know what you're doing out there. Look at you. If you came to be mellow, you can turn around and get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm jacked up because anything Rage Against the Machine uh, gets me fired up, man. If you've listened to the last, I don't know, six years of this podcast, uh, many, many, many times, the band Rage Against the Machine comes up. Years ago, I was going to have Tom on. He broke his foot. Never got to have him on. I was bummed. But uh, this, is, this is even better because I always love to give drummers glory. Like I always say, drummers don't get enough glory. No good drummer, no good fucking band. That is the bottom line. You can get by with a weak bass player or a shitty singer or a, a subpar guitar player, you know. Uh, but if you got a bad drummer, you're not going to go to the next level. 100%. Uh, with Rage, they got all four killers. They're a lot like Van Halen, L.A. band, four-piece, all of them crushing on their instruments. Uh, and just monumental. And uh, as we get into the uh, episode, you'll hear... Uh, all the questions I always wanted to ask, Rage, and I hope you guys enjoy this. And if you don't, eat a dick! Because <laughs> I don't give a fuck, man. This shit is hard work. Just fucking with you. Uh, let's see. Great shows this week. I'm going to be in San Francisco. Got to get your ass out there. Let's do this, man. Let's turn it up in 2018. Let's sell some venues out. Let's... Uh, Let's see what that's like, Dell Razors. May 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. I'm headlining San Francisco Punchline. That's this week. Get your tickets. Come out. No excuse. I couldn't get a babysitter. I'll catch you next time. I had the swine flu. An earthquake hit. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. Get out there. <laughs> uh, now let's see. What else do I got? Um, uh, in two weeks, I'm going to be in Arizona at the House of Comedy headlining. And that will be May 16, 17, 18, 19, and uh, 20, Arizona House of Comedy. And then New York City, I return May 23rd. You can catch me uh, probably most of the summer at the stand in the, the Comedy Cellar. So uh, looking forward to that. Also on the hunt for a new place to live all the same nightmares you know weekly over here in the del rey mind the deegan the part-time meat eager eater the deegan not vegan i'm deegan anyway i want to give a shout out to uh the donators this week on patreon i love you guys michael macy thank you for uh donating mark blazik you are a god. Thank you for donating. If you want to donate people to the podcast, it's easy. It's patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Also, I forgot to mention June 7th. This just got added. I'm headlining in Boston at Nick's Comedy Stop. Get your tickets, Boston, one night only. This is going to be great. Last time I was there a year ago, it was packed, and we had a great night. So come on out. Get your tickets. 
Those are the shows on the board right now. Um, what else is happening? I guess that's it. I just, I just want to thank, uh, I want to thank Brad one more time before I bring him on here because it was, uh, man, I was fired up. I was just so. Sometimes I just say, you know, like you're you're working your ass off, and you're like, God, is is anybody fucking listening out there and shit? And then some good stuff happens, and you're like, right on, man. I don't care if anybody's listening. I got to sit down with Brad and and talk to one of my uh, favorite drummers for hours. So that's a win. I love all you guys. Keep the candles lit. Don't forget, you can find all the episodes on YouTube now. Subscribe to the YouTube channel or subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. Keep leaving those reviews. We're over 1,000, which is awesome. I want to try to reach 2,000 now. Why not? I also want to hike Half Dome this summer. I will do it. As Brody would say, Brody Stevens, I, you got it. I'll do it. Anyway, I love all you guys. Here we go. Brad Wilk. All right, welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk today. Fantastic guest. Wow, introduce yourself, man. What's happening? I'm Brad Wilk. Nice to meet you, Dean. <laughs> oh, man, dude. It's so funny. You don't even know how much I love Rage Against the Machine. It's really? unbelievable how much I've talked. What, 400-something episodes? And... Um, you know, every time somebody's like, wow, who is it for you? And I was like, oh, yeah, like, I'm telling you, I've seen everybody. Yeah. Everybody there is, except for Zeppelin and Skinner, I've yeah. seen them. Really? That's yeah. cool. And top five, hands down, Rage Against the Machine. Well, that's really nice to hear, man. Thanks. And you know what's funny is like, when the band came out, I, I got the first record sitting over there. Yep. I wasn't down. At all. Yeah, a lot of people were not down. You know why? I think it was because it was like nonstop everywhere I went all of a sudden. It was like, fuck you, I won't do what you tell. And everywhere yeah. I went, I was like, nah. Yeah. You know? And then I went to the Fillmore. Evil Empire drops this that week. And you guys do a show at the Fillmore. It was Remember for it. Wow. Bill Graham's uh, music program. Yeah. That week, yeah, like one night was Counting Crows, one night's Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. Wow. And it was this benefit for uh, music programs in San Francisco schools. So I go, oh, I'm going to see this. And that night changed my life, man. It was one wow. of the most powerful shows I've ever seen. Well, that's really incredible to hear. I, I really appreciate that. I remember that show well. And the Fillmore was one of my favorite places to play. I think that might have been the second time that we played right. the Fillmore. But we've, we've always had incredible, incredible shows there. And the Warfield as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. then I saw the Warfield. Lit. Yeah, of course. It's incredible. But as far, I think a lot of people in America... Uh, especially we were a really hard pill to swallow um, at first. And that's why, you know, we spent the entire first record. I think we went to Europe like six times. Right. Um, and we hit over there way before we hit in the U.S., you know, because the record was, again, it was a hard pill, pill to swallow for the U.S. It's really, really putting a... Um, uh, putting a microscope on what's happening in the United right. States, and a lot of people were, were really put off by that. I was, I was more like, to me, it just felt like it was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You, to me, is what it, it felt like the opposite. It was wow, like, oh man, huh. you know, Lollapalooza was huge. Yeah. Um, and this great music scene was happening with like Tool and and you know uh, early stuff of like Pearl Jam and and all the grunge and everything. Yeah. But to me, it just seemed like every bar I went into, yeah. and, and I'm San Francisco, so San Francisco loved great music. So they were way, uh, you know, like I mean, you go into a bar, it'd be Nick Cave, Nick Cave, you know, it Love would it. be like. Uh, you know, rage. Then it'd be like tool on the yeah. jukebox. Yeah, wow. And 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 I remember specifically, I would go into bars on Hate Street and be like, "Fuck you! I won't tell what you tell." And I was like, "Man, I get it, dude." But I tell you what, the magnitude of what this band and and I was glad it kind of hit like that for me because then I had the whole first record to dive into after Evil Empire, you know. 
But the magnitude of this band is, to me, is just so insane how much I love it that I, it was weird. I don't know why I was fighting it, you know? Well, um, you know what? <laughs> I got to say, some of my favorite bands, I had the same experience. Yeah. That, that happened to me for, for, with, like, Jane's Addiction. Right. Happened to me with the Sex Pistols, um, where I think initially, when something's really, really great yeah. and really different and unique, I'll have... Um, that's for me. I'll kind of step back from it and go, wait, whoa, hold on a second. What the f- what the fuck is this? Right. That's a different experience that um, than what you're talking about. Um, it's interesting because we were, you know, we caught a lot of flack because we were on Sony Records. And Sony Records pushed the hell out of this band, yeah. and our whole philosophy was, you know, if we can have a major label distribute us around the world and not change our message or our music in any way whatsoever or our artwork or anything you know then then we're gonna go for that and we're gonna go f- go for that with no apologies yeah and funny enough like i remember going to seattle i was just uh, telling the story a couple of days ago going to seattle we were playing at rock canyon we were opening for the breeders oh wow and i remember zach and i walking into that club and fucking Sony came and postered the entire fucking room with our first record. Full wallpaper. And we're opening for the Breeders, who yeah. I love, um, and we just were mortified. Just rude. Yeah, so cut to like Zach and I like pulling posters off the wall because we don't want to be hated by this band that we're opening for. Um, so a lot of times it was almost like, uh, pulling back because uh, Sony was was so much uh, behind us yeah. that we weren't used to that, you know. And we were really good at biting the hand that feeds, and we were constantly doing that <laughs> and then being rewarded for it, which is a really strange thing to go for. Oh yeah, because you had really morals. Young. So yeah, then yeah. people start backing it up, you yeah. know. And it's like, oh, these guys aren't aren't looking to uh, cash grab. It, it's funny because at that time, I absolutely worship like NWA. Yeah. I'm way into Public Enemy, uh, awesome. Fear of the Black Planet, all that. So Incredible. the combination, once I get my head wrapped around it, I'm just like, this is like some of the most brute force, you know, because I was such a metal freak, and I thought that NWA was an extension of metal. They were so, in a way, they were so powerful. I hear, you, I hear that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it just took over from, like, you know, Metallica to NWA seemed normal to me. Yeah. You know? And, and then Rage Against the Machine is just like, wow. And then once I get into it, it's like, holy shit, man. The lyrics. The, but the live show, I don't even know how you guys could play like that that brutal uh for that long well you know honestly i think we were always a live band that's where we connected the the uh the power between between band and audience was always so strong and i think at a certain point if you think about what you're actually doing you'd never be able to do it i would say that 85 percent of it at a certain point, it's just all will. And yeah. I think I was in a band with three other members that all had the will to put every ounce of everything out on that stage. And it was less a form of entertainment. It was just like a dire need yeah. for us to, 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 to do this and to, to relay this message and, and to have this experience with, with bands. And to this day, you know, I'm still in a band with, with three of those guys. And to this day... We, I still feel the same way, unbelievably. Like I, I, that's what I'm looking for is that connection between a band and the audience, and you're just taking it past um, what you can do physically, and it just becomes pure will. Yeah, yeah. Like last night, I saw Priest. You yeah, know? that's right. I think Tom went to that. I yeah, saw that he went. Yeah, to that. yeah. How was that? It was probably awesome, right? It's was, it was great. You know, it's great. Um, but you really start to think about uh, like, wow, well, Rob's. You know. I don't know, I think 70 or something. Incredible, yeah. You know, and you're thinking about uh, double bass, you know, Scott Travis up there, you know, you're thinking about these guys burning the leads and then Rob, and it's like, wow, you know. It's crazy. It's it's, seeing that gives me hope. Um, So I'm 50. I'm not really, I'm a few months away from 50, but I just say I'm 50 now. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, 
because it just feels right. You just start that. getting used to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You fell 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, so this last tour I went on, I remember just feeling like, wow, I st- still have this energy um, and, and this power like emanating. And I was so thankful and grateful for it. And then started playing you know i play just don't even think about it. i'm usually playing as and digging in as hard as i can and this is the first tour where i wound up like blowing out a knee oh my fuck my fucked up my leg and this is the first tour i was like whoa you really gotta um you're stretching shit yeah like all that stuff you really gotta take care of your body it's like um it, it it's it's something that's that's vital the, the older you get and i want to yeah. be doing this for for a really long time so yeah, you picked a you picked a, a a hard music to play. Like you're not doing jazz or something. No, and it's like Lombardo. I talked to him. Yeah, you know, he's amazing. I love him. Last time I saw him was uh, oh, he was playing with the Misfits at the Forum. Oh yeah, which was the which was such an amazing show. It was I brought my my kids and my girlfriend with me. And we had the greatest time. My kids know all the like Misfit songs. They're, oh, they're wow. nine and eleven, and it was so awesome because the second that they started. It was like watching a classic punk rock show, but at the forum and just the entire crowd, yeah. you know, just a turned pit. into just a pit, pogoing, just like you just could feel the energy from, from the first note, which was awesome. And Lombardo just killed it as he always does in every band that he plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His new band with fucking Mike Patton is unbelievable. Yeah. And those right. guys are straight old school punk, yeah. you know? yeah. I love Mike Patton just as an artist. He's constantly oh, that guy's a god. Yeah, he's just he, he has a, a phenomenal voice, and he's constantly. Um, it seems like staying true to his artistry and doing whatever the fuck he wants to do, regardless of uh, of what anyone thinks about. It. Yeah. I think it's easy to do that when you have a monster big record and you, you walk away yeah. with big money. Then you go, all right. Uh, it was a lot like what I thought that uh, Sean Penn did back in the day. He would do yeah. a big movie and then he would do a bunch of cool indies like that yeah. Nixon film or, or whatever, you know, because then yeah. you could go do shit you wanted to do. Yeah, I was, I was talking about this three days ago that I have so much respect for Sean Penn. I remember when uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High came out. Yeah fucking went to see it at the Galleria where it was filmed and Sherman just Oaks. loved yeah, yeah loved the movie so much and I remember a few months afterwards like hearing interviews with him and he was just pissed off because everywhere he went you know people thought he was this character yeah this fucking Spicoli character and I think the next movie that he did that came out was Bad Boys right that I knew amazing about anyways, right? which was the antithesis oh yeah of fucking Jeff Spicoli and, and I just remember going holy shit this guy is an incredible uh, actor just the soda cans in the fucking uh in, in the uh, pillowcase yep. took that fat fucker out and then <laughs> the nerd right. kid with the bomb on the blaster yeah, yeah. you know the guy's like oh someone left me a ghetto blaster and That's he's playing right. it oh man that film was great badass, right that made me want flick. to be a vandal yeah <laughs> <laughs> just get out there and get crazy that's right we want juvenile delinquents for sure <laughs> yeah let's talk a little bit uh you you uh you grew up in la for the most part, I was actually born in Portland. Right, lived there for maybe a year less, a little bit less than a year. Moved to Washington, lived there for maybe a year and a half. Then moved to Los Angeles, uh, Northridge, Northridge in the Valley. Yeah, and, and I grew up there until I was eight years old, uh, and then I moved to Chicago. Whoa! Yeah, for, was your dad in the military? Or no, something? my dad was a was a jeweler. He was oh, wow. a bookie. He was like whatever he whatever. Was he know, a gangster? Whatever he could do. No, he wasn't. A, no, he wasn't a gangster. He was his his family came from like the jewelry business and and actually furniture business. Yeah. Um. But for the most part, he was a jeweler. And but we moved around a lot. And so we moved to Chicago. I was there from like eight to thirteen, which are formidable years. Oh yeah. And it seemed like a lifetime that eight to thirteen in Chicago. I'm really glad that I was in in the Midwest right. during those years. I had a incredible upbringing there i lived in a in a town called homewood which was a very inter, interracial yeah. interracially mixed um town so i grew up you, you know, got a lot of flavors yeah i mean i had a you know i had a lot of african-american friends i had a lot of white friends I had a lot of italian friends yeah um and we were just it was a melting pot which, which was awesome um then i moved back to los angeles in, when i was uh 13 
Wow. And, uh, Perfect time to be yeah. in L.A. Yeah. You got some OP shorts and a BMX bike. There you go. A, a dog exactly. tat skateboard. Maybe a hang 10 shirt. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Incredible some vans. time. Yeah, some vans. Some two-tones. Yeah, and I was like, during that time, I was just a massive um, Van Halen fan. Like, that was my band. What, what, which record gets you going first? Well, the first, when the first record came out, I remember I was in Chicago, and I was in my basement, yeah. and my brother had the 8-track. He brought the 8-track home, and I'm sitting in my basement doing what, I don't know, playing with an Evil Knievel doll or some yeah. shit like that, and I hear, the first thing I hear is, is the beginning of Running with the Devil. Which, oh, yeah, which with sounded, the car horn? Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is the car horn. Which kind of like, I never knew it was a car horn until yeah, that's recently. That's it was a car horn. Yeah. Of course it was a car horn. Yeah. But it's, to me, it sounded like an alien ship <laughs> yeah, landing. Yeah, yeah. I always and thought it was just Eddie. Right. And then, uh, yeah, the first lines. I live my life like there's no tomorrow. All I've got, I had to steal. At least I don't need to beg or borrow. Yes, I'm living at a pace that kills. I'm like, yeah. fuck, I'm in. Yeah. Like, and coming up from the basement. Then the second song is Eruption. Ooh. And I'm, my mind is blown. Um, that's when that day I wanted to learn how to play guitar. I just wanted to learn how to play eruption, you know, at yeah. the, whatever young age I was, uh, eight years old or whatever. Um, oh no, no, I was probably like 10. And, and so I remember hearing that and I was hooked because I loved that band so much. My brother decided not to like the band because he was three years older than me. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so I just, you know, stole his eight track and they became my favorite band. Anyway, so cut to... Um, living in LA, I, I got here. My aunt at the time was working for Barry Diller at Warner Brothers. She got me tickets to Van Halen for the Fair Warning oh. concert. Very first concert I've ever seen. Wow, what a Van tour, Halen, right? Fair Warning at the Forum. It was the still to this day, probably the, and maybe it was because it was so impressionable because it was my first time, but still to this day, it was the most incredible show I've ever seen. It's imprinted in my head yeah. for life. And um, I, just, I knew that I wanted to to do something that that had to do with music and be on a stage and and relate to people in that way. I think that was the last great Van Halen tour because I, I, I agree. I saw them all because after that I Dave agree. becomes the circus guy. You know, look at all the people here tonight, and yeah, he's just not saying. I'm going to fuck your girlfriend. And totally sing half agree. the lyrics, but up, you know. And it's funny because I've heard people say, you know, Eddie or uh, David was never a great singer, and I disagree. Totally disagree because, with that. Uh, if you listen. Uh, to the early bootlegs, he sings great. Sang and his ass sings, off. Sings like the records, you know. Yeah. And I think he sings amazing on the records. Yeah. Um, and he it, had that scream that... Um, yeah, that weird reverse it, scream. It's very unique. It's like, it's, it's, it's like almost like two different notes or two different octaves, yeah. and not a lot of people have that. Totally unique to him. And, and uh, the lyrics of Fair Warning, I don't even know where the fuck he got dark, those, right? Man, right? Loved that record. Oh, I still that, have my... The I cover? that same Final. The cover was like I just oh. that record meant so much to me, and the tour was unbelievable. I Incredible. I often tell people about it. Me and my buddy Greg from the Mother Hips, uh, I found this website that has all these bootleg footage and everything, and there yeah. it was. I found the uh, Oakland show that I went to, nice. and uh, you know you just look at it and you go, "Fuck those guys, man, are just insane." They were. They knew what they were doing. I love the fact that. When they came out, it was almost like they rolled out of the bar. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. they're just like having a good time, but they were not fucking around. No. And they, they played so much and they had this uh, synergy between the four of them that was so unique. And um, they were like, you know, even though they were all incredible, they were greater than the sum of their parts. Like when yeah. they're all playing together, you were being hit sonically with something that was, that was huge. Yeah. Huge. Huge them and ACDC at that time with Back in Black and oh. those about to rock. Yeah, back in Black and, the, and, and, and Diver Down. I remember those were like. Yeah, man. Those, those are the like same the years. Huge yeah. records, same years and just massive records. I went to the Us Festival and that was. Uh, you did. Yeah, yeah. Missed that. Yeah, man. So you. Okay, so you see Van Halen and yeah. then. What takes you from guitars to drums? Because did you get a guitar and try that first? Okay, so by the time I had seen Van Halen, I was already playing drums. Oh, wow. But when I heard the first record in Chicago in my basement, that's when I started, that's when I wanted to play guitar. Yeah. So 
uh, begging my parents to get a guitar. I get an acoustic guitar and I go to my first guitar lesson. And, you know, by the third week, I'm still learning Jingle Bells. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I just, this is like... The teachers me. don't get it, right? The teachers, I, I didn't feel like I had a good teacher, not to necessarily just blame the teacher. I was also young and probably impatient. Always had a guitar. I, I had a better time learning stuff on my own on guitar. Me- meanwhile, while that was happening, one of my one of my best friends, Vince Punty, who lived down the street, um, he had a had a drum set with a huge Kiss logo on the on the front head, and I was remember always going over to his house, always wanting to play on that drum kit. Yeah, um, I probably annoyed the fuck out of him because I just would go to his house, go straight to the drum set, and just start playing, and it always felt pretty natural for me yeah to play the drums and it was like oh fuck i'm already i'm already fucking going here and i'm i'm, I'm both emulating what he was doing and i'm also just having an easy time picking things up um from what i'm hearing so right when i moved to california is when i b- was begging my parents to to take uh drum lessons and to get a drum kit they're like okay you know what we're going to let you take drum lessons. We're not getting you a drum set. You're going to get this practice pad. Oh, yeah. And they practice gave, pad. They gave me a practice pad. And I had that practice pad for a year. Yeah. Before really? I had a drum set. And, really? And I was so fucking frustrated with this goddamn practice pad. And no one around me had, had drum sets at the time. Long story short, it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me because I had nothing, no distractions other than to work on rudiments and form yeah meanwhile was i was completely frustrated it was the best thing that could have happened the best thing that could have happened then i got a drum set and what was the first drum kit you got cb 700 the oh. worst possible drum set that you could possibly oh, CB700. Possibly own. it's just like, as it should have been yeah it was, yeah, it, yeah. It, it was it was you know it was perfect and i was just in love with it and and was what color was so it? happy it was red yeah yeah it was red and had like these light blue uh, lugs um well chrome with these light light blue lugs um but man i just played the shit out of that thing i didn't even have a throne i remember i would like set up by the couch oh that's funny i got a drum kit uh my neighbor gave me a drum kit he was in pablo cruz wow wow that's pretty cool how old were you i was like a kid in like seventh grade awesome and he gave me this uh maybe yeah seventh grade he gave me a, a, a blue Vista Light. You're kidding. Me. Yeah. And and he goes, Yeah, wow. playing the band Pablo Cruz. I was like, Oh yeah, find your place in the sun. I love that. <laughs> and uh I had a kiss garbage can. Uh it was aluminum and I didn't have a throne, so I would sit on that and one day it just collapsed, you know. <laughs> But I remember I had a drum kit, that drum kit for about four months, and then I took it to the guitar store and traded it for a Gibson SG because uh, wow, I was like, Angus is me. I'm not a drummer, you know. Dude, that's a that's a great guitar. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, you said trash cans, and I'm like, why back in our youth, trash cans were like so fucking cool. Like they had the Fonzie trash. Yeah, cans, remember that? Or I had the Planet of the Apes. I had a Planet of the Apes trash can. Where did those go? Yeah, where are they? Yeah. I don't see those anymore. <laughs> I can certainly don't have any cool. That's trash shit is great right i had <laughs> yeah. the kiss one i remember yeah, it was, yeah. Oh, i remember when it collapsed i was so bummed That's i was like funny. oh fuck i'm i'm envisioning that right now <laughs> once you get the cb 700 and you're starting to play yeah it's it, it's weird to be a drummer as a kid right because you need a car to move the drums around you do and, and you need a band to play with and stuff what how do you get it going well i when I was younger, I really, that's all I wanted to do was start a band. And so I was the guy that was like talking to my friend, oh, you should play bass. And I like convinced a friend of mine to like start playing. Like junior high shit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Start playing bass, guitar. And, um, and then he would come over to my house. Once in a while, my mom would take me over to his house. We'd pack up the, the drums and was totally grateful for that and I'd go over to his house. I remember one of my first bands I was in that we were the guitar player we were playing with was like already, you know, we were like in junior high and he was in his in his twenties, had like a red flying V. Oh yeah. And you know that, well that's how you had to play back then, remember? Oh yeah. It would be the guy with the the new mustache. Dude, right? Okay. <laughs> 
That's it. That's <laughs> and, him. And he, yeah, and you'd go to his house, and it was kind of—he was older, so it was kind of weird. He'd have black That's light it. posters. My mom and, wasn't sure about yeah, it. Yeah, a Me, bong, a bong. All yeah, of it always were, a bong. And we're sitting in the garage, and like the first song we learned how to play is like "Ides of March." Yeah, and Wrathchild. Yeah, and like all these like you know just metal songs, Van Halen songs, Scorpion songs, um, and then and then a couple of. Originals, a couple of originals, <laughs> yeah, and their names would be like uh, Starfire, <laughs> you know, your originals. Always that, you, exactly. You didn't know what, like, what are you gonna write about? You just know about like, you know, Maiden had crazy lyrics and Van Halen had party lyrics. Yeah, it was all over the board, right? Yeah, mixed feelings. <laughs> that was the name of a <laughs> mixed feelings. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first originals. Oh. Yeah, all oh, but we were doing it, so you know, it felt it felt good, and then. It's always this next. The uh, junior high quad play at the quad. Did you do that one? The you know lunchtime what? concert. I didn't do that. Um, I did not do that. What happened to me is I, I played in junior high. Then in high school, my brother was three years older. My brother's like, "Hey, there's this guy I want you to meet. This guy named Shelby." And I, this was like in the valley. Yeah. Taff, Shelby Craft. You got you got to meet him, man. He's like uh, seen him play. He plays like Eddie Van Halen. And, uh, and I remember, I'm like, oh, awesome. And, I, and my brother introduced us. I go over to his house, and he proceeds to sit on his bed. He's like, okay, don't judge me right now. I'm just, just going to warm up. I'm just yeah. going to warm up. And he proceeds to play Eruption in its entirety, like note for note perfectly. And I'm just shitting in my pants going, this is it. Yeah. I found my fucking guy. Yeah. I'm fucking play. So wound up playing with this guy all throughout high school and another friend of mine who played guitar, this guy, uh, Kyle Bear, who played guitar and I played all throughout high school with these guys. So we were playing like in Shelby's garage with no air conditioning, yeah. you know, like 110 degrees in the garage all throughout uh, high school. You had a and, singer? Uh, we no, I sang. Oh, and you the sang. Guitar player sang. Whoa, you yeah. sang while we were sang, on the drums. I sang, and it, for whatever reason, it it was pretty easy for me yeah. to do. And we played a shit ton of Led Zeppelin, and then and then lots of other songs and originals. And originals too. <laughs> um, Makes feelings. But the You're funny, hit yeah, single. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then um, nobody even really knew. Like I was pretty quiet in high school. Yeah. And um, slightly shy, so nobody even knew that I played drums until twelfth grade. That's when like there was a talent show, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go play the, the, the talent show. And I remember uh, me and Kyle, who's a guitar player, played the talent show, and I played YYZ because I was a massive Holy shit. Rush fanatic. But I played the live version, the drum solo, yeah. that was on Exit Stage Left, which right. I sat in my room for you know eight hours a day learning in the summertime because I was just obsessed. Um, I was into Rush like before Led Zeppelin. It was like Led Zeppelin, I wasn't even into. Um, it was like just after puberty. I remember going through puberty late. I remember hitting puberty and I, I was like, wow, I understood Led Zeppelin in a whole <laughs> other way. And I was, I was completely blown away by them. Anyhow, though, I just, so yeah, I wound up playing the, the, we wound up playing a Led Zeppelin medley into a YYZ drum solo. And I remember like after that, like, so, like people coming up to me and like getting this recognition that I'd never got before, which was like, felt cool. I was like, oh, this, you know, this is yeah. really what I'm into and people appreciate it and it was, um, it was kind of, it was a neat feeling. It is a cool feeling because yeah. I remember in school, there's really, these clicks are so hardcore. So tough. You got the jocks. It wasn't, it was exact to like the outsiders. Instead of the socials and the greasers, it was the jocks and the stoners. Totally. And I was somewhere in between. Same. Like I played some sports, but I loved rock and roll. And Same. I wore a leather jacket. So people thought I was nice. a weirdo because Metallica <laughs> had these leather jackets and yeah. I had one, yeah. you know? And that was like really weird to wear a leather jacket That's in awesome. high school, oh, yeah. you know? I mean, I love Fonzie, 52, so okay, we're right there. Okay, so about there. the same, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, you That's know, awesome. in school, as soon as you do some kind of music thing, is, which is what I did, I sang one song uh, for this uh, high school courtyard jam, and then all yeah. of a sudden, you, you know, people are like, whoa, man, and then you go like, yeah, I want to do this, you know? Yeah. I also was the the lunchtime DJ. Like wow, I'd spin music on Friday. You went like this. Were you? Not, were, I didn't do that. That's just the move <laughs> for DJ. Some, 
you know what That's I mean? That's awesome. Yeah, but you were doing it. You were I would DJing. bring records. I'd play like Ted Nugent, Van awesome. Halen. My first record, Cat Scratch Fever, by the oh, way. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, Cat Scratch Fever was my first first record that's a that's a jam well that's that's pretty awesome so you were bringing the music to the masses yeah that yeah cool and i was all i had long hair yeah, yeah. It was semi-long and, and yeah. then by the time Def leopard hits i've got I a remember. perm fucking amazing i got a perm that's dude amazing. yeah right that's fucking that's incredible <laughs> and i'm looking like sammy hagar meets fucking uh <laughs> pete willis from Def leopard <laughs> That's incredible. It was just kind of the thing you did, man. You know, you're yeah. just so into rock and you're trying yeah. to figure out how to be rock. How to be it and look it. I actually remember um, looking through BAM Magazine. Yeah. Um, that, do you remember BAM Magazine? Of course. Okay, so I remember looking through BAM Magazine in high school and I was just like bummed because I'm like, I will never look like this how am i gonna fucking what was your look how, then how were you gonna, were you just short hair had like short hair then like after high school I grew my hair super long yeah kind of had like really wavy almost curly like long hair yeah for a while but that was shape. hip for a while yeah yeah i guess i don't know but i just remember feeling like wow i just don't like fit the you know fit the look and um you know, and and the music I was into, like I I played. Like I remember when punk rock hit, I was like, kind of like I said, like Sex Pistols. I remember the first time I heard, I'm like, ah, fuck, I don't know. And then slowly but surely, I'm like, this is the fucking greatest band, yeah, um, ever. You know, to ever like re record a record. So that actually came for me later. And in high school, I was into like, like Parliament. Oh yeah, uh, James Brown. Yeah, I love that. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Lakeside. Um, I remember them. It's all the way live. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all the way live. That's awesome. I remember playing on Ralph Johnson was the drummer from uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Ooh. this older dude yeah. had his Jade like seventeen piece drum set. I remember one day going over to his house in high school, and all of a sudden he had like Ralph Johnson's drum set. Yeah, he bought he, it somewhere. That he bought. Whoa. somewhere like a guitar center or something and it had his like emblem on it and i'm like holy shit and i'm playing like like metal songs and rock songs on like ralph yeah johnson or fuck what's his but last i mean name? what about earth wind and fire dude it's such an it's incredible so band. crazy you know incredible when i was a kid i was engulfed in all kinds of great music you know yeah. it would be like devo earth yeah. wind and fire then it'd be craft work and then, so I mean, cool. I was all over the board, you That's know? That's the best, though. That's it like, really it, was. It's the best. That was so. That was uh, the great thing about living in Chicago was that, you know, I'd, I'd, depending on whose house I was at, you know, during the week or on the weekend, I would get all these flavors. Like, if I was visiting, like, or with my, like, African-American friends, it would be Earth, Wind, and Fire. Totally. It'd be Parliament. Yep. It'd be James Brown. Like, yeah. and, um... Stuff like war and oh, war, you know, and then and then you know my brother's friends, you know P Peter Gabriel and the Who and uh, and Led Zeppelin and all this. Yeah, they were the older stoner kind of proggy dudes. Yeah, and they'd be into crazy. I mean, I remember Boston would be playing like, yeah. daily. Boston, that that first record was an incredible sounding record. That thing's amazing. Just m massive record. So it was really. I think it's really cool to be able to be influenced by all these things and and have all these genres of music around you i think yeah. that's what's what had a, had a um big part in my musical dna it was just like there's all kinds of good music everywhere and you know in in every type of musical yeah, yeah. form and it definitely really set you up for later on drumming and rage against the machine because yeah. you know um we're talking about funk and hip-hop beats yeah and um and and that and you know instead of just being standard metal because that's what set you apart so far from being a, a, a metal band other than zach but i'm saying the grooves are yeah. so funky you know boom 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 boom, boom you know all that yeah. shit and and you know bullet in the head and stuff like it's it's heavy but it's also funky you yeah. know well thanks that um a lot of that had to do, you know, with, with all of us having really eclectic uh, backgrounds in music. Also, I, straight out of high school, I actually went to a school in the Valley called Dick Grove. It was like my, 
only serious musical training. I didn't have enough money to go there, yeah, and I couldn't get financial aid either um, because of my parent situation. So, because um, they had enough money, but had, not enough to give you, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like borderline. Exactly. So, so they're like, I remember going to the office, and you know, the guy's like, you know, this guy's true blue. He wants to just take some of the courses. So, I studied under uh, David Garibaldi for about okay. six months, and he's the drummer from Tower of Power. Yeah. yeah. Super funky, super incredible uh, drummer, and just an incredible mind. I learned probably more in that six months than I did, um, you know, in in all my years before that. But but having that, and then having, you know, band listening to bands like James Brown. I remember going in high school, like going to bed with like Parliament Records on repeat, and um, at low volumes, just yeah. like getting this stuff ingrained into my head. Um, so having that background, and then Led Zeppelin was so huge for me, and Black Sabbath, both both um, uh, Bill Ward and Bonham were, came from like they loved Motown and they loved jazz, so they had this swing. Yeah, they're old dudes, you Same know. With and Alex they were, Van Halen. Yeah, so, so yeah. So they were so they were influenced by um, <clears throat> by these people. I think that's all, also the best way to like really learn about your instrument. It's like take your heroes and then find out who their her heroes yeah. were, and like bring it, keep keep bringing it back. Absolutely. Same with comedy. You know, yeah, you look yeah, you look yeah. at guys and you go, this guy's incredible. And they yeah. go, oh, well, go back. And you go, oh, well, this guy, this is, I see where this is coming from. And then he just added on to it and, and made it himself, you that's know. The, that's the best, being able to find that stuff. It's Absolutely. Like treasures. Um, I think that James Brown 72 band with uh, with Bootsy and his brother, yeah. live, uh, live Power Piece in uh, Paris, yeah. the live one, yeah. I think that's probably one of the greatest funk records ever made. It's incredible. It really is. Uh, you know, a lot of people love the early stuff. He's really theatrical. This is a man. It's wearing right. the cape, cape and all that. I dig all that. But once you get into what I'm talking about of a live machine that you cannot believe that they're playing live yeah to me still when you see that you go those guys are playing live they are you know and There's they're playing no at like breakneck speeds breakneck speeds. and it's still funky oh it's still how funky. does that happen i don't get it <laughs> so, it's, it's yeah. a phenomenal thing to, to oh, watch and, and oh man. i have some incredible james brown uh bootlegs like oh. dvds as well that are just i think i have might have that that's incredible. That show. And you watch that show. Mind it's blowing. insane. And the people in Paris are just kind of sitting there like, whoa. Like yeah, they're getting their faces melted yeah. off. Man, I also love that era where James Brown's on B3. Yeah, you know, oh, I think it's yeah. like right around that era too where he, he really gets into the uh, Black Power thing, you know, the uh, Black Panthers and everything. Yeah. He starts playing B3. Yeah. He's got the cool fro, the look and everything. Yeah. Man, he he is an absolute god. He is. I just wish that he treated his band better. Yeah, yeah. Man, I just like I was just listening to this. I by the way, I just discovered podcasts like embarrassingly. I just Oh yeah, discovered yeah I read the podcast and I'm like this is fucking incredible. Yeah. So, you know, I've been listening to you and like Mark Marin and uh the trap set which I which I, I I'm going to do as well. Anyways, pop, podcasts are are incredible. Um to just for me to just be finding right now it's great though and where was i going with this what was you're that? talking about you're uh, treating his band right oh yeah so i was listening to the clyde stubblefield yeah interview on the on the trap set and it was it was i let clyde stubblefield is you know one of my heroes and it's really sad to hear how fucking bad he was treated i mean the dude got paid 200 bucks a week had to pay for his own fucking hotel rooms had to pay to like keep his suits clean uh, like, and he had a, a family at home he, he didn't care though because he was doing what he what yeah. he wanted to do so yeah. anyways it's like it's it's both incredible and it's also like jesus christ like like james brown like man like, yeah when you watch that documentary and he finds oh, bootsy and he goes here's where he's gonna find me for yeah, 50 yeah. bucks <laughs> yeah. and this, i made two mistakes so he comes over he goes you know i got you you know i got you <laughs> You know, I got you two times, 25, two times. And, and no one even knows what he's doing. And he's, he's telling him right there, he's finding him 25, yeah. two times. It's incredible. That's insane. It, it's fucking insane. To be incredible. on stage and that good yeah. and being like, all right, I got to go over and find this guy real quick. Yeah, he ran, he ran a, a tight ship, man. He did, he did, he man. a tight ship. Yesterday it was two years we lost to Prince already. Can you I believe know. it's been two years? I can't, man. It's, I can't it's, either. It really sucks, man. Him, 
actually you know the older we get it's yeah. like you you start realizing oh my god like all your heroes you know that yeah. you grew up listening to it's like you know it's just like a um a natural act death we're all yeah. we're, we're all assured it's you just forget happen. about it you know you, you do especially when you're younger yeah you and, take it for granted you're like these guys will be around forever i always tell people go yeah. see these bands yeah, yeah, yeah. anyone yeah. if you like them you know when i come to town i can't tell you how many people man i really wanted to make it i'm sorry i couldn't i, I might not be around next year you yeah. know what i mean i'm yeah. just being honest on anything can happen no it's so you know true. and this is the world we're living in it just seems like it gets crazier and crazier every fucking day <sighs> oh it's, it's fucking brutal yeah you, know, you can't even like feel good about sending your kids to school without worrying about it's you know, scary shit man blasted by a semiotic weapon. it's crazy yeah let's get into this now um okay you, you're playing you're doing high school you have this band greta yeah uh, yeah and and you're out doing that and you're trying to get things going and uh now early on did you play with eddie vetter i did somebody you know, told I, me that you know i don't i don't talk about it I, very very often but yeah i was in a band with eddie uh, pre greta uh me and the guitar player kyle bear we were in a band with eddie and i found both eddie vetter and tom morello in the recycler no remember shit. the recycler oh and, hell and yeah the, the best the yeah, best yeah, people don't know that you grab it yeah. yeah here's the ad uh M music uh drummer wanted long hair a must <laughs> good exactly. looks must exactly. have good Must looks. have looks. Must have looks. So and then uh, fucking uh, so pro equipment. Uh, we have major label interest and uh, and, and, major and label financial interest. backing. Amazing. Don't forget about that one. Amazing. Financial backing, which meant some coke dealer right. was throwing money at their demos. Amazing. You're so you're digging you're through familiar. a recycler and yeah, you I'm find Eddie Vedder? And that's how, yeah, that's how... Uh, I found Eddie, and Eddie was living down in San Diego at the time. Right. And, and what year are we talking? This is what eighty eight, maybe eighty eight. Yeah, eighty eight, maybe yeah. eighty nine. I'm yeah. so bad with oh, like, me with too. Years, I, but around yeah. that around that time, um, and I remember meeting this guy, and honestly, he he was uh, just an incredible uh, person when I met him then, and he had this this unbelievable voice. I remember just as a person, I just remember like we would go down to San Diego as well. Um, so he had an to, ad in the LA Recycler. Yeah. I'm a singer looking for band. Yeah. And you guys would go down and jam with him. You had a band? Correct. And he would, he would come up as well. And I remember like going before we like, uh, we, we were going down to San Diego. He would just call us up. Hey, you know, uh, can you, uh, uh, you know, bring some like extra blankets, you know, if you're like, you know, if you have any like extra blankets or anything. And, I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, no problem, you know. And I, I'm thinking, you know, that, that it's for him or whatever. And we go down there, and he's like, yeah, I know, I, you know, I know these are the homeless people. He really uses this. And we go out, and it's like he knows every wow. homeless person is just taking care of him. He's like the most compassionate dude. Back then? It, back then. And, and I remember that having a really huge influence on me. Just like, wow, this, is, this guy is really... Uh, good dude and it's so funny because me as being a rocker i'd be like this fucking weirdo we're out of here man we're trying to get a record deal you're out here with blankets i'm just being honest back then no, you know I, what i mean yeah. that's wild yeah it was really uh i thought i just thought it was really really cool and it what kind of music were you guys doing we were like doing rock like rock but it was also funky as well and then he had this incredible voice i just remember just, god you're the fucking greatest fucking singer yeah like i've ever heard and like nobody you know even knows it yet and anyway so yeah we we played in a band we were playing in a band and he was fr good friends with jack irons yeah yeah yep. Drivers, which i just love jack irons as a drummer who later played with them who later played with them and was played in a band called 11 and i remember jack during that time um knew stone and um oh, and yeah. jeff amen oh yeah and they were looking for a singer and i remember jack hooking them up i remember like eddie so eddie had a truck at the time he left his truck at my house yeah and he's like yeah i'm you know i'm gonna go up to seattle and there was a part of me it was just like oh wow like i i heard some of the music they were doing i was like wow you know it was always really cool about it. I was just happy for him. Yeah. Um, that he was getting this opportunity. He left for six days. I, I, he comes back. I pick him up from the airport. Yeah. He has half of 10. Uh-huh. And t maybe two or three songs from Temple of the Dog. Really? On a cassette tape. Yeah. And I remember him putting it in, and I'm like, 
oh shit oh you're out of here um, yeah i'm like this is, but i was so i was honestly so happy for him i didn't have that's incredible history right there dude the you pick him up at the airport yeah and you basically hear 10 before anyone part yeah. of 10 yeah it was it was incredible and i just knew right then i'm like wow this is this is this is your your path yeah um so he wound up going up there made a record that whole seattle thing is is, is popping off they go to england to do the to mix 10 yeah which tim palmer was doing i get a call from eddie hey uh you know we just lost our, our drummer and i'd love for you to like come up and meet everybody and you know I'll send you the send you the tape of the song so i'm like shitting my pants yeah wow. yeah never been out of the country nothing go get my fucking passport listening to the songs i'm super young i'm like wow this is my wow this is my break yeah yeah this is my time and so i go to i go to europe and we play together um and me and eddie have this history and you know we're bonding over in europe yet i'm you know to the other guys i'm kind of just the new guy yeah of course and this and is when they the saturday night live guy he goes to saturday night live right the drummer correct. right yeah correct so he so, thinks it's not going to do anything he gets an offer to play in the saturday night live band he splits right and then you so you go to europe and you're actually auditioning no sorry this is even pre that pre this, that this is um the original drummer that uh, played on the demos? No, no, the real drummer that played on 10. Oh, I got you. Is, um, oh, the guy that wanted to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He had drug, he had yeah. drug issues. Yeah. So, they, so they, they needed a new drummer. So this was like right after that guy. 10 wasn't even mixed yet. Wow. So they're in England. We're at this, in this farmhouse in England mixing 10. And I'm just like, just so just young and like, whoa, what, this is incredible. This is happening. And they're on Sony Epic Records. Right, that's right. At the time. And so... Um, anyways, long story short, I go there and I just don't, I just don't click musically, um, with the guys with, with like, with mostly with Jeff, who's, a, you know, incredible bass player, awesome guy, but we just, you know, this is, and this is a classic, uh, case. It doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah. Chemistry is everything. 100%. And so. It just wasn't clicking for me. I was like, wanted to be blinded by that because I'm just like, this, I just want to be in this band with yeah. my, my my buddy, and what an incredible opportunity. Um, so it and it and it didn't work out. And I remember kind of leaving Europe with my tail between my legs, and you know, driving off, going, "Wow, fuck, there that was there's my opportunity." So how many days did you play? Were you play with them one day and no, they figured no, no, it out? No, I was like, there about a week. What? And so there, you guys are rehearsing during rehearsing, the day we're and it's playing and. Some of it actually, I thought was sounded incredible, but wow. maybe some of it, you know, just just didn't for whatever reason, you know. Yeah, that's that's the way it goes. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't exactly clicking, and who knows, um, who knows for whatever other reasons. But I just wasn't the guy. Wasn't and then they get Dave, a Brazil, right? Then they got no. Then they got the Saturday Night Live guy. Oh, that. Oh, then, okay. then they I get, get Dave. You. But actually, what I didn't tell you is before this happened, before I went to play with Eddie. I auditioned for a band called Lockup. Oh yeah, with yeah. With Tom Morello, yeah. which I didn't get the gig for either. <laughs> but Tom yeah. loved me. Wow. Like I, I, I remember going in and playing with Lockup, playing their songs. My drum set is falling apart. I yeah. can't afford like cymbal stands. I remember almost killing the bass player. I had this huge fucking china. Like and a it fell out. At the end of the song, I smashed this china, and it just goes. <laughs> falls like almost takes his head off. Falls and um, it's so. But Tom loved me, and I remember Lockup broke up right after that, and um, and I felt a connection with Tom too. And so I was like, "Do you want to get together and jam?" I said, "I will play with you anytime." You yeah, want. yeah. And me and Tom maybe played three or four times, and we played at the at the Hollywood rehearsal, which is the you know mur right across from Murder Burger oh, yeah, on yeah. Hollywood Boulevard, classic rehearsal space. And I was like, "Wow, this is." I really felt a connection with them. Just whatever is happening there was he playing that was like that style back then or what was he eddie van halen oh no no he had like you know he had like this little tape recorder like you know the know your enemy i remember very distinctly like playing know your enemy and yeah. a couple other um riffs that were on our so first, he was playing our that record. style playing that type of style he wasn't like necessarily scratching yet right, right um but but to me i was like looking at him going whoa you're fucking way out there and you're you're you have this incredible uh 
a gift on the guitar and he was like a really smart dude and and responsible yeah and uh yeah which is hard to find in rock really hard to find it's such a breath of fresh air right totally. when you find a guy that's not like dude i totally. can't make it exactly oh, and he's from chicago oh yeah so yeah. it's like so like we bond on that anyways i play with him a few like four times eddie calls me and i'm like hey tom i, I just want to let you know i'm uh there's this band called pearl jam my friend you know no one knew who they were i'm gonna go to europe didn't work out. I came back home and I just was like, I was already on fire. Yeah. I came back home and I was just lit. I'm like this. I had so much passion, even like twice the amount of like wanting to, to connect and be in a band and be music. And Tom called me up and he's like, so what's going on? Are we going we, we gonna to be in a band or not? Yeah. And I remember at the time I was playing with Greta yeah. too. Because I was playing every day of my life. That's like, awesome. This is all I have. I'm, if I'm not going to do this, I'm going to be fucking selling shoes for the rest of my life. And Are you working a job at I the time? Wanna, day yeah, job? I mean, I, I, I was delivering pizzas for a friend of mine who still owns uh, Fratelli's Pizza out in the Valley, one of my best friends. Wow. So basically all I did was drive around and listen to loud music and, you know, delivered pizzas in the meantime. And that was my job to, to you know... And you're living at your parents' house? Was living... Um, I was living... At my mom's house, and then wound up living with say, in the valley with friends and stuff like this. Yeah. Um. And then Eddie and I had an apartment on uh called called the Nirvana, which is on Orange Weird. in Hollywood. Yeah. And it, there were so many cockroaches in this apartment that we had to put up uh, like black uh, hefty bags. Yeah. Covered the entire apartment with black hefty bags, which was quite a look. It was like you know nine inch nails in, in an apartment. Yeah, yeah. Fucking hilarious. So that so I lived there. You and um, Eddie Vedder had an apartment? Yeah, an apartment. Yeah, that's it, crazy. It, down here. And he was still living in, in San Diego, so he would right. you know, come up. This was a very for a very brief period. Yeah. Um anyways, I came back and I was and I was um, still in Greta too. And so I remember Tom like, are we gonna be in a band? And I went and met him at Kenner's and I'm like, I so wanna be in a band with you. But but I was still playing with Greta with with, uh, with Kyle, who I was on the talent show with. So I'm like, I'm still in this band and he's like, Fine. Fine, you know, you, if you want to play in, you want to play in two, two bands, fine. Yeah. Um, and Greta was like, I told Greta, I'm like, I want to play every day. They only wanted to rehearse three times a week. And I said, I want to play every day, so I'm going to be in another band. And it was a little strained. And that, so I was playing in Rage Against the Machine um, that didn't have a name yet and, and Greta for a very short period of time. I remember one time I played two shows in the night. It was like, um, and, and then slowly Rage Against the Machine started just picking up momentum and I had to tell the guys in Greta right. that I was leaving. It was really hard for me. Anyway, so I wound up doing that and, um, and you know, I wound up, <clears throat> I just remember playing with Tom and then we played with this other bass player and Zach for the first time. Oh, Tim wasn't in. Tim, Tim wasn't in yet. Right. But, um, but Zach <clears throat> was good friends with Tim. Zach grew up with Tim. Yeah. So, but we were playing with this other bass player. It was this one time. And we were, didn't have a name, anything. We weren't even really a band yet. This is the first time I meet Zach. And it's in a tiny room in the valley. And Zach comes, comes in. And we just start what's playing. What's the idea for uh, Tom? Is he like, let's get a hip-hop guy... Uh, I mean, is he is he throwing the blueprint at you, like, or is it just kind of like we're looking for a singer we can't find? Because singers were really hard to find. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. Tom has gr a great vision, by yeah. the way, but not necessarily. We were also playing with Maynard. Oh wow! Tom and I were jamming with Maynard. Wow! Oh, I time. saw I saw some footage of that once. Really? I think so. Wow. Is it like in a wood loft or something? Or mm. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I dreamt that I don't or know, something. Man. But maybe. I remember. I've never seen it. Though. I remember hearing or seeing something where, yeah, he was there for a minute. You know, yeah. maybe it was a photo, something. I don't could, know. Could have been. Yeah. But anyway, so we were jamming with with Maynard. Then we we meet, who was fucking unbelievable too. I'm like, wow, it was just such a great time in music. Yeah. Right. Um. And. Anyways, cut to Zach meeting Zach for the first time. He comes in. I think he had like a beanie on. Um. You know. To, um comes from a total punk rock background but is also super into hip hop. Yeah, he had that punk band. Yeah, and 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 so exactly and inside out and yep. so but he was really branching off into hip hop and he wanted to do hip hop. And I just remember starting a song, starting to play a beat and from the second like I kicked in with the beat, dude was Richter like jumping off my fucking drum set. And we're just it's just the four of us yeah. in a room. 
it's real. Yeah. And I was so excited to find somebody that had this feeling as well. And even at that time, even more so, where it was just so, it was like, it was like his life depended on every fucking syllable that came out of his and what, what did mouth. he have? Just some, Was he just uh, ad libbing off the top of his off head? The top just of his going hip hop style? Bouncing off the fucking ceilings. Wow. And I just remember being, being completely uh, blown away by that. And, and that was the start of it. Zach knew Tim. Yeah. And, um, and so once he does that, though, you guys tell Maynard, nah, you know. Yeah, and Maynard was already playing with Tool as well. Right. Maynard right. might have said, oh, I'm going oh, yeah. to go do this, right. this thing, thing with Tool. Um, so we and then so so cut to Zach bringing Tim in. I got this guy. He play, plays bass. And I remember the first time all four of us played out in out in the valley, um, Sunburst Studios. Sunburst Studios, yeah, which was Liquid Jesus's uh, practice space, which was a band. Yeah, yeah Liquid Jesus. Yeah, Liquid yep. Jesus was a band. The four of us get together. I remember already feeling this stuff with Zach, and then bringing Timmy in. And I remember playing and just feeling like holy shit, whatever is happening here yeah it's a classic case of like we are lightning in a bottle some of our parts yeah whatever is happening sonically musically everyone um was in like like right from the start that's how i remember it was like whoa this feels really fucking special and tim was just a, a tree stump you know a yeah. fucking bass player and, yeah right and um and I just well, what was Tim's background? Was he like metal or whatever? Because those bass think, riffs are definitely not metal. Yeah, no, he was Tim was a massive Rush fan. Oh yeah, too. But he was also I think Zach taught him how to play bass. Um, and the first like bass lines he learned was actually like Sex Pistols songs. Wow. So he had similar. Him and I had like similar um, um, upbringings. Bad Brains was a huge band. Oh yeah, yeah, huge bands for us. So. Um, so yeah, so and, and he was just you know an unbelievably competent bass player. And whatever, for whatever reason, whatever happens when the four of us are doing it, there was some um, connection that made it uh, feel bigger than any one, any of us in the room. Right. And, and that was the beginning of it. And we we made a we decided to make a twelve song demo, I think, before we even played a show. Wow. We we're gonna make a demo. You know, I remember like uh, "Killing the Name" was one of the songs. We're like, you know, we have a song with sixteen fuck yous in it. No, no record company is ever gonna, yeah, look and you know, look at us. So we decided, and this is all Tom. Tom was really good because he'd already been through being in a band called Lock Up and having a really bad experience on a major label. Yeah, Tom's like, we're gonna make our own tapes. So we wound up doing that. We play our first show, and. Um, is Tom starting to do the scratch and stuff and Tom's all that? Tom's starting to do the tr scratch already over the summer. I was, we're making these records. Yeah. These things are, are, are coming into place. And, um, and by the way, um, we're all going to rehearsals listening to, you know, Led Zeppelin, Minor Threat, Cypress Hill, Public Enemy. Right. Like all these, those are like the just, core bands. Just a great, all, just a great combo. Yeah, that we're, that we're all listening to. And it's funny, that's why, you know, it's funny that we're in a band right now. With, that's, like, inc that's insane, right? That can be real. It's yeah. just really weird. It just makes the most sense. But, so we make this tape um, over the summertime. We play our first show out, I think, in Riverside. And from the second we start playing, the fucking place... You know, it's a party. Yeah. It's a party in a house. And this place kind of goes fucking Richter. And I've never felt that yet yeah because you're you're playing originals too playing like all, that's all weird you're at a like a keg party let's say or yeah. whatever and people are waiting for you to break into like maybe right. fucking man in the box or, yeah, or yeah. it's not it's not out but you know what i mean yeah like the hit that's going on yeah i think we played one <clears throat> copy which was clamped down by the clash and right we did it in our in great our song way. right great song anyways by our second show playing like in hollywood our second show Record companies were flocking. That's crazy. Where are you crazy. playing Raji's or what are you playing? Like uh, Coconut Raji's, Teaser? Coconut Teaser, Club with No Name. Yeah. Um, what's the one on Pico Jabberjaw? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing Jabberjaw. And I remember that's. So we're getting all these record. We're getting all these record companies handing us and this cards. Is, this is what? Uh, 92, 91? No, no, this is 90. 90. Is 90. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, um, and I remember. Uh, Sony Records, a guy by the name of Michael Goldstone. Oh yeah, Michael Goldstone. Really into the band. Yeah, I had already met Michael Goldstone with Pearl Jam. Oh yeah. So he's he's already out in Europe, 
and he comes and then he you know there there I am again in this in this in this band he wants to sign the band um uh, on the I, second gig third gig by the second or third gig it happened really bizarrely quick for that's us. insane it is insane yeah it, let's say it, we never dreamt that that would happen again we made a tape because we thought no one would ever right no one ever and like sony records epic records um a, a week or two later they they come through with the heads of epic records they all come through we're at sunburst studios yeah they all come in in their limousines or one limousine and there's like four of them i think there's like to the rehearsal uh -huh, studio there's like the, the head lawyer there and they're 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 sitting there and and we have a little set for them yeah and the first song happens to be bullet in your head oh my god and it's the same thing we're all playing it like it's the end this is the last show we're ever gonna play yeah because that's how we do it yep and and i remember them just not saying anything and just like sitting there with like wide-eyed and we didn't know what to think yeah and we're like would you like to hear another song yeah yeah um okay and then we play like know your enemy yeah, you fucking go go into that, um, and and then there was like maybe one other song. We stop playing, and they go, "Okay, thank you," and they walk out, and all of us are like, "That's it." We're, no, we're just like, "Fuck." Yeah, they're, they're, we're never gonna see them again. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Didn't say anything. Then we find out like three days later, or, or no, probably a day later, like they want to sign us. They don't want us talking to anybody else. Yeah, and they were actually just scared for their lives <laughs> because we were singing all these songs they didn't realize yeah. we're just like four of the biggest fucking dorks that could be that yeah, actually yeah. just have something to say and play like our lives depend on it and so that's I mean that is the feeling when you hear it though because not once have I ever thought that rage wasn't that you know what I mean uh, also say with the clash yeah, or uh, sure. public enemy you know yeah. all the way up until uh, when you see that you know it's like oh my god especially at that time it's got to be like who the fuck are these guys you know like what's the, the message is crazy you know yeah I you know I and that's ballsy for a record company there's zero radio play uh, at the time in your mind right so what are they looking at which is so genius to think about that they're like, we see something here. Do they see kids are going to eat this up like punk rock? Do they yeah, see, think, you know, what? I, I think they did see it. I think the head of Sony at the time was Dave Glue. And yeah. you know, he had watched Led Zeppelin. He wanted us to be the next Led Zeppelin. We just right. didn't have it together enough to right. actually um, be as prolific. We, you know, we, we made that first record and then there was just problem. You know, we had problems you know we yeah. made our second record came out what six years yeah later or whatever but um but you know i had um i have no regrets for what rage against the machine was and i and i i love what that band was but i think that they saw what it was and i remember going to the sony convention up in canada the first time and we played with like bands like um uh, Soul Asylum, yeah, and like all these other uh, yeah. screaming maybe trees. Blind Melon or something, maybe Blind Melon, yeah, something like that. like that. But that era, you yeah. know, yeah. And I just remember right before we go on, Michael Goldstone, Michael Goldstone, just saying, just be yourselves to do everything you want to do, whatever. And I remember we played like four songs and then destroyed all of the rental gear <laughs> <laughs> that like other bands were supposed to be. Oh be, no, be playing. Um, Dave Glue, head of Sony, is eating it up. Just yeah. loves it. And we're not, we're actually trying to piss. We're like, fucking, fucking Sony convention. This sucks. This yeah. is horrible. Yeah. There's people in seats. Harry Connick Jr. that night tried to get us, he was in the audience. He tried to get us kicked off the label. He was like, talk to Dave Glue. Hilarious. You, you sign these guys, I'm, I'm leaving. Like, you cannot sign these people. And I remember we went to uh, New Orleans like two months later and like sent tickets to us. <laughs> <laughs> to his, to his, manager, his management company. Um, I love it. But that, it was that day though that I realized, oh, they're like we're biting the hand that feeds, right? And they're and they're okay with that, and that's yeah. a weird feeling. That is a weird feeling because uh, once you get in the studio, uh, your artwork, your your message, and everything has got to be really getting some pushback right i mean this album cover um if, if people don't know what the photo is uh yeah. you know watch the vietnam documentary yeah. uh, that's out uh, that was out on um pbs 
and you'll understand the magnitude of a man who lights himself on fire for a message. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one of the most uh, insane <laughs> real photos ever. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's- I mean, that's a real photo. So to, for a record company to let you put that on, because you always hear these stories like GNR wanted to put the, uh, the space shuttle exploding as their album cover. Right. You know, to be able to put that on the cover yeah. is insane. Well, I believe it or not, we had no pushback from the that's record company. That's crazy. That was, the, that was our hugest concern was like, one, if, if we do sign with you, you're never going to... Um, uh, give us any flack about our music, about our artwork, or anything that we say or do. And they and they were they were cool with that. It was in the contract. They were they were cool with that. I remember the only time that they had a problem is when we, the first time we played Lollapalooza, we we got to L.A. and I guess um, K Rock, who was totally behind us, was playing Killing in the Name, but they were editing it. Right. Yeah. And Zach yeah. went off on this r- rant like "fuck K Rock." I think he got the crowd to like yeah. you know chant "fuck K Rock." Um, and yeah, because they're editing and editing our fucking right. music because Zach is a fucking purist. Yeah. And he's like, fuck you. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if K-Rock's playing it or not. Yeah. And, um, and I remember Dave Glue at that point just freaking out going, just can't you just say fuck Sony? Fuck Epic Records. We don't care. Don't say fuck K-Rock. Yeah, yeah. Like, these guys don't are- Don't fuck the money we, machine. We need these. Exactly. We need these people. Um, I That's think a that strange was, evil, right? Because yeah. You, and also as a band, you do want airplay. Come on. But then the you don't want airplay. It. You know what I mean? It's such a weird you thing. You don't want too much. You don't right. want to be- right. Um, but it's interesting that you say when we first came out, it was like everyone and everything. Because I had a very dis- different experience. I but remember. I hung out with hip people. Okay. I'm not, so, try- I'm not trying to say I'm hip or whatever, no, but no, I no. hung out with music heads. So those were the people that knew. But like the general right. public, I felt, really didn't, didn't right. know what was happening yet until maybe our second, yeah. until maybe our, maybe our second record. So, um, but it was, it, so it was interesting, but, but people did gravitate, Killing in the Name, and then our first, uh, gravitate to Killing in the Name, and our first video was Freedom, which was about yeah. uh, Leonard Peltier, which is one of the best videos um, that I've ever been involved with. I forget the guy's name who made that video, but uh, just a, a great video. Um, but it was it was work for us in the U.S. Definitely, yeah, work for us to to get our message out. And when you when you sign the record, do you get a crazy million dollar deal or whatever like those things were going on back there? Because I saw the the epic footage of you guys at Sound City from the Sound City movie, yeah, which is one of the greatest films uh, ever made. Oh yeah, uh, that hats was, hats I off, love that. I yeah. Love that, that but you guys, you know, Garth does the record, and you guys are yeah. I see in a tent. In the studio, like yeah. in a tent, you guys are playing it. Well, that was the beauty of it. Actually, wasn't that's was it funny? A big it looked deal? like a tent. No, it was a it was a huge deal. I had never, you know, I was living hand to mouth. Yeah, you know, uh, so to be able to have some money in the bank, and it wasn't, you know, we got a good amount of money, but you know, you also have to. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Of course, it's you have smoke, to and, make the smoke and mirrors. It's total yeah. smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Um, you wind up owing the record company yeah. just tons of money. Um, um, however, we were at Sound City. I w- we were making our first record. First week, the fucking red light fever. Like, we had red oh, light yeah. fever. We're oh, like, yeah. why isn't this sounding like... Just <laughs> eating dicks. Yeah. <laughs> playing too slow, too small. Yeah. Like micromanaging yeah, it. We like, don't, you oh, know, there's no groove. Yeah, we can't play. You know, I don't... We, I didn't even know what a click track was at that point. And right. so... And Garth has uh, got Garth, you on a click. And Garth was like, Garth looked like a clown in front of me, like going like going like this time. And we're just like, yo. I mean, at one point, I think he he suggested moving Tom's guitar tracks back zero 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 point one, whatever or something, completely fucking with the true dynamics of our band. Yeah. So it was it was a little bit of everything of nervousness. Maybe Garth not at first getting it. I remember a weekend, Garth goes fuck this, we're just going to put all the monitors in the room, invite all your friends down, and we're going to record, and yeah. we're going to have a party. Rad. I so, saw the footage. So that's what we did, and we wound, up getting, got, we wound up getting more than half the record that night. Wow. And it was just live, or no one, you know, there's no, um, there was never any click tracks or anything like that with any, yeah. any Rage stuff. I think Renegades of Funk was the only song we ever used to click to. But, um, and so that's, so that's how it worked for us. Same thing with Evil Empire, yeah, which was recorded in a small rehearsal room in in Cole Studios. Yeah. Um, prior to that, though, we went on tour 
for many, for it seemed like an eternity, six and a half times in Europe and everywhere else um, around the world, the record company thought it'd be a good idea for us to now go live together in Atlanta to figure out our shit because we weren't sure if we even wanted to make another record. Because oh, it was pretty volatile. Because you guys don't really know each other. No. And then you, you, you do... Except th- Tim and Zach. Right yeah, so you did. do three gigs. You get a massive record deal. You're thrown out on the road and now you're like, oh, I don't even like this guy or I like this guy. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. you, all of a sudden you're with... Uh, it would be like if you went into a room and there was four women and they said... You, you're going to marry one of them. You don't even know who it is. Yeah. And then you go on a honeymoon for yeah. a year with that right. person. You go, whoa, I don't even know this right. person. And they go, you're not going to marry one of them. You actually are going to marry all three all, of them. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so that's what it was. And fame came really quickly. And we had a lot to, to deal with. And, yeah. um, and we were all four c- complex individuals. And so we went to Atlanta. We recorded like 26 songs in Atlanta, like on just like rehearsal tapes that I think Tom just found recently. Um, we wound up living in a house together, just absolutely miserable. Everyone's home with their families. Our manager's out playing golf, and we're still living together. Why are you out there? Because of Brennan O'Brien? Because of Brennan O'Brien. Gotcha. And, we're and why do you choose Brennan O'Brien? You, you, because at the time of Pearl Jam versus and everything, he's doing great records? He was connected with Sony. We met him. We really liked his vibe. He liked to do things quickly. He was a fantastic fucking engineer. He's incredible. He knew how to get the, you know, and, and a great producer as well. And and he knew, um, he knew how to get things done quickly, and he knew how to capture the magic. He was looking for moments, yeah. right moments. And, and we were a band that, that just happened to have good moments, and so he had a really good ear, ear for that. And so we wound up making, so we wound up going to Atlanta. It was a disaster, um, and we came back home, took some time off, and then went into cold rehearsals. Brent Do you guys down. almost break up? Almost broke up. Yeah, we almost yeah. broke up. Yeah, like like three times. And what was the main problem? Is because to me, it seems like when you've got someone like Zach, uh, who's an explosive front man, mm-hmm. um, it seems to me like he would have the hardest time dealing with fame. Um, y- you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And, and again, he just came from such a, a punk rock right exactly. aesthetic that like all of it was. Like, it was weird to me, and all I wanted to do was to have a band like this, and it was fucking bizarre for yeah. me when it actually happened. Like, oh, this isn't anything like... Well, yeah, because you're, coming, I, you're thought, coming from a Van Halen world of, oh, right. we're going to be big rock stars. Which, and, I was gonna, which I was just going to say, by the way, it wasn't that for Van Halen either. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you've read that. Right. No it's Monk great, right? It's Ooh, insane. Man. But as a, as a uh, t- 13-year-old kid you're seeing what's right in front of you yeah. and it's a slightly a bit of an illusion. No, um, you're not seeing any of the bus rides or the plane rides yeah, or the hotels and the loneliness. The best of yeah, and, totally. And, and so anyway, so yeah, it's just I think fame is a lot to deal with. You're put under a lot of pressure. You you know, you're you're doing interviews at that time and then you're putting lots of stake in like what people are writing about you. Yeah. And it's just a fucking huge head trip. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge yeah. head trip. And there's a lot on all of our shoulders. There's a lot on Zach's shoulders um, as well. Um, so well, he a- starts carrying this big thing also, right? Of right. like, fuck everything, you know? Yeah. Fuck, fuck these wars that are going on in places. Yeah. And now he's taking on all kinds of stuff that's bigger than the music. So then the right. interviews start becoming stuff like about that. He- at- and not the music. Correct. He doesn't ever want to talk about the music if he's going to do an interview, right. which I just give him total respect for. I'm completely not like that because I come from a different uh, a, di- a different background, but I love the fact that if he's going to do an interview, he doesn't want to talk about trivial shit. He wants to talk about fucking Chiapas and what's going on yeah, yeah. down there. And that was like what our... He went down to Chiapas uh, r- right before we, re- we recorded Evil Empire. Yeah. So anyways, we come back, we're in co-rehearsal, and Brennan comes down just to check us out and see how it's going. How's it going now? Yeah. I can't believe you guys are in a rehearsal room together. He sees that we have like a, we have some songs even. Yeah. We have a few songs and he's like, 
fuck this. We're actually coming in tomorrow. Yeah. Miking everything up. I'm going to snake a fucking huge cord across the room where we're going to have a board and everything and, and we're going to make the record starting tomorrow. Wow. And I'm like, what the fuck? We're like, you know, I'm never, I'm always like, oh, we need more time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we need to rehearse more. At, what t- at the time, what songs do you have? Do you have like Vietnam or Rolling, Rolling Down Rodeo or what? what's in there? Well, actually two songs that I remember mostly. One was, we had Bulls on Parade, and yep. I remember that was the only time where the song was written. I remember walking out of the rehe- rehearsal studio, and I remember having talking to Michael Goldstone that day and just went, oh, we, we wrote our first hit. By yeah. the way, I don't know shit about like what a hit and yeah. what is not, but I just felt something. It was sticking in your head. It was like, wow, this, is fu- this sounds fucking great. I remember that, and then I remember... I remember having Vietnam, again, driving in my 65 Fastback to rehearsal. Uh, on oh, the you radio. had a Mustang? Yeah, I had a Mustang. Rad. Yeah, just, you know, classic Mustang. It was a 64 and a half, yeah. actually. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Fastback. <laughs> Pony um, interior? Did you have yeah. that? You know that had the ponies running across the yeah, back? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and Queen's Another One Bites the Dust comes on. Oh. And, and in Queen's Another One Bites the Dust, a lot, there's a, this fill in it that goes... Um, yeah, yeah, at the end, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that is just so sick. How can I use that in a song? And the, the first thing, it's also Clash. You know, it is. this yeah, yeah, yeah. is a radio, radio Clash. clash. You know what I mean? Right. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a dance beat 100%. that that slips in there and then gets you going, man. Yeah. But I remember it was that particular feel. I'm like. I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna try and fit that in today, and it just so happened Tom came in with that, bow down, da down, bow down, da down, um, and I just somehow tried to incorporate that fill yeah. into that part that had that. Da, 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 that became that, and then the other part was just complete like Zeppelin, maybe wonton song, is it? Right. Um, so anyway, I remember those two in particular that we that we had beginnings of. Um, so you guys start tracking because. Yeah, you know, the record yeah. came out 22 years ago and you posted that up. I know, it's wild. I think this could be one of the greatest records ever made. Well, 100% really, in my eyes. Yeah, it's really nice to say. All I, all I have to say is that it's my favorite Rage record. Oh. Um, and the way it was made, it just, like I said, it's dark, it's gritty, it's funky, it's yeah. heavy. It has all the elements that I love, love about music. And it was recorded in such an honest way. Um, just such an honest way that it was recorded. How many days? Um, maybe t- maybe two and a half weeks. Wow. Yeah, and then Zach did some you know overdubs as well. And even when Zach was overdubbing, he was you know in the studio with this mic with a fifty eight. Fifty eight. And just you know would come in and fucking do you know one take or whatever once he had had the lyrics and and that was it. That's crazy. But he was always in the room when we were recording, and that was a big part. Oh yeah, of like so recording. he can yeah get the vibe. It and was it was really great to to have him, and his cadence um, certainly has an effect on on how I play, and I think on how every everyone else plays, and everyone else has and everyone has ideas, you yeah. know, with, whether it's drum ideas, guitar ideas, bass ideas, or vocal ideas. It's like it was a it was a um, it was a democratic uh, band. It was a democracy, which was also incredibly difficult. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, wait, you know, I always wanted to ask you because I always wondered when the, uh, some of the fall of Rage Against the Machine, when I look at the band, I think there's no way this band could keep going on because they're so fucking high potent and, and, you know, and also I I just can't imagine Zach at, at like, you know, 55 years old or something out there i could see why it doesn't go it's hard to do yeah yeah. it's hard to do man i mean his yeah. voice like i don't know he had to have lost his voice a few times on the tours oh yeah he oh, lost yeah. His, yeah i mean yeah because i mean he is just going for it yeah even in the very beginning you know i remember our shows had to be cut short because he's putting every ounce of anything everything right. into his fucking yeah his, his vocal cords but you know 55 what is the new uh 30 yeah right? yeah well if you start training because <laughs> i did go to the, the last show ever at the, at the uh coliseum. coliseum yeah and it was fucking insane I love, you know that was you know if it, i hope it's not our last show but if that was our last show it was yeah. a great way to go out I remember the scariest thing at that show. I actually hadn't been scared at shows in years. You know, when I was young, the fires. So, 
well the fires were going on on the astro tour for, yeah. i used to do a bit about it i, I used to do this a bit like I, I used to do a bit where i was like yeah man i could tell i'm getting old because when i was younger i'd take drugs at concerts and be like we're gonna die and then when i saw when i saw rage at uh coliseum someone lit astro turf on fire and i was like yeah. that, that's gonna cause cancer <laughs> <laughs> that was my bit burning like, fucking plastic gonna, hey, yeah i remember ruben was right next to me i go that's gonna cause cancer wow and how stupid was that mm-hmm. though for them it was a USC because yeah. yeah. USC was still playing there. They decided yeah. to like cover the entire yeah. fucking ground with this flammable material. The part that scared me was you guys came on. We're ready to get some machine from Los Angeles, and you keep getting burned out, and then the sound went sound out. Sound goes out, and I go. We have no idea, by the way, that this is happening. Well, yeah, yeah, because you're on the stage, it's going, and I go, oh, this place. And then it came on for a minute, and then it went out. I go, this yeah. place is gonna, uh, this place is gonna rage. Yeah, it's gonna erupt. Yeah. And I Same was like, thing happened at Coachella in two thousand and seven. Yeah. When we I, first got back to that, that was my favorite. It's like, what the fuck? Yeah, um, you guys blow systems. You're so is, heavy. What is what is happening? That was crazy. that was an incredible show. The, the 2007 was that like, was uh, I had that was my, my favorite. Hair standing up in the back of my neck the whole time, man. That that crowd was actually it, bull shows, but that Coachella we had been away for a long time. You had been away a long time. And that crowd was, was phenomenal. That when you guys sit around and think about. Like I think that was 07. When you think about getting back together, how does it go down? Is it is it some phone calls? Like, all right, let's do it. The only reason why we got back together yeah. had nothing to do with us. There was a campaign that started it, and um, it was it started over in England and on a, a Facebook campaign. Yeah, uh, make killing in the name number one for. Oh, cr- I for remember Christmas. that. Yeah, and, and and it was really just the 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 anti X factor thing. That's right, because they had they, they didn't want they didn't want that to be number one. Because every year it's it was like the number one, and it just seemed like the worst machine fucking yeah. bullshit that you could that you could possibly imagine. And music is turning into it. it t- music is turning into this. So. It was had nothing to do with us, which is the beauty of it. Rage Against the Machine is like we get back together when like the people fucking call, and that's yeah. when we get back together. That's usually usually what what happens, and so that's what happened. We we became uh, the number one after twenty years. Killing the Name became number one again in the UK, and we vowed to play a show, a free show, at Finsbury Park if this happens. Right, and I'm like, oh shit, that that happens oh shit we gotta <laughs> go play a free show now oh shit we have to be a band yeah but it was actually a one of the most shining memorable moments for us as a band everything went right yeah that day and, and i remember walking off that stage feeling really good about the four of us as human beings and about the band and i'll never forget it, jimmy page was on the side of the stage the whole time watching i couldn't get that out of my wow, fucking head right jimmy, page jimmy dude especially all the years of you listening to zap and stuff Ugh, they're just they were so huge to me yeah it seems right now like um in this political climate man that i thought for sure rage would get back together instantly in this thing i mean more than anything right now because of all those uh great political gigs you guys have played over the years and 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 you really do have a great message and of course you're doing profits of rage right now but it's weird that zach has been completely gone in all of this of the worst turmoil of the country in years you know yeah well you know he hasn't been completely gone he did release of one day as a lion record he yeah did, he did i love release, that the ep yeah he did release a single um uh, maybe a, a two years ago or something so he hasn't been completely out of it and i i i i know that he's working on music yep I, um, constantly john theodore told yeah. me they were yep. yeah yeah but uh but you know um i mean right now t- doesn't it seem like it yeah i mean there's n- nothing would make me happier than to be able to you know fuck shit up right now yeah um with with rage against the machine so it's just it's just really a matter of getting us all on the on the same page and and if that will happen again or not i have no idea but i know that at least the four of us um are amicable and can like talk to each other and right. like actually even go, uh, go hang out um on occasion so um i think more we just want to be friends yeah um first more more than anything what seems to be the 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 problem 
It was, um, it was like you guys just ever, didn't ever sit down and talk or anything. You're just in this big fucking cannonball, yeah. and then it crashes sometimes, and it's yeah, like, I, whoa. I, you know, I think it's just like how many bands are around more than f- five years. It's true. It's true. You know, and I think like we've been around since like, you know, I get it. I, I, I get it. I played in bands. I'm just asking yeah. you because I've always wondered, you know yeah. what I mean? I know people it's always, wonder. The funny it, thing it's is, like, is, what's behind that closed door? It's always been something different. It's always been somebody different. It's always yeah. like, it's always something. Yeah. It's like for us, you know, it's kind of like the magnets, the fucking magnet theory. It's like <laughs> one magnet's always like yeah. being pushed out. Yeah. Fucking, <laughs> you just got to get all the magnets together to fucking stick together for a minute and, yeah. and and that's always uh been sort of been our, been our problem obviously i, I don't know, i feel like a politician right now because i kind of am, am skipping i know specifics but i understand but that's just kind of the, the best way that i can yeah an, answer it yeah, yeah. <laughs> she got a weird smile on your face. <laughs> i get it man it's a tough question and 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 it's a private question a lot of times you know what i mean yeah. um I think that part of the genius of your band is that you do only have four records out, you yeah, know? I was going to say that as well. It, the Mystique has always been amazing about a band. It's long gone. I can't imagine, like, yeah. Zach being on Instagram right now with a selfie, like, me getting sneakers, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I don't imagine that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that is probably one of the top reasons I do love you guys, because I love... Uh, mystique and rock and roll yeah there's there's no there's it's that's non-existent people are always like when are you gonna put some stuff up on youtube of my comedy it's like hey when are you gonna leave the fucking house and get and go see a live show it's not gonna be the same when you look at me on a youtube screen you know what i mean that's your deal like oh fuck yeah man it's like and and of course I got to do Instagram and stuff, but that stuff I love yeah. of photos and sharing stuff with yeah. people that I look as more of like, Hey, get into this or whatever. Yeah. That's the only thing I have too. I have Instagram and I just, it's like two years ago. I started, yeah. I started, but it's I'm great though, never done social for that media. kind of stuff. Yeah. At the, at the peak of you guys, you did a lot of, uh, pretty radical shows and stuff were you getting some uh heat from fbi and stuff like that from behind the doors oh i mean we all definitely had you know we all had fbi files yeah um for sure and we were you know and we were always getting in trouble with cops in um various places um especially down south and um so so there was always uh, the protesters at shows from the other side and and like this, but there are also, I have to say as well, there was also police enforcement that absolutely loved our band. And I was always in, a little bit in shock by that. And yeah, also yeah. kind of like, cool, you know, it's like, you know, every fucking single cop isn't, isn't a fucking, a, a, a bad, you right. know, a bad cop. It's like, um, so, so it's interesting that, um, you know, that there's probably FBI agents and CIA agents that might appreciate yeah what it is that we do but then there's also people that, are, that i know that, that of course we're, be, we're we're being watched and yeah um, and that's a weird feeling especially once you start having kids but i'm not i'm worried less um about them than normal people this is normal yeah. normal people not, you know? who aren't normal but you know what i mean yeah R- right you know but like you think back in the day you know before our time it was always you know fbi and cia you know putting hits out on people and making it look like the normal people yeah. now it's fucking everybody you yeah. gotta always be watching your ass yeah it's and i'm crazy. a fucking you know i'm a sitting duck like i fucking i'm you know yeah i'm sitting on a fucking drum stool <laughs> Let's get a little bit into Audio Slave a little bit okay. here. Um, you guys put this together. It, it was a smash, you know. I mean, you go from Zach, one of my uh, all-time favorites, to the other all-time favorite. I'm like, yeah. these guys. And now you have kind of an opportunity to kind of do a Zeppelin sound. Yeah. Uh, when you guys get together, what is the uh, idea of it? It's just a straight rock and roll band, right? Well, yeah, I... B- Bad Motor Finger for me was just a, a massive record, and I was already a Soundgarden fan. But when that came out, right, I was delivering pizzas at the time, and I remember that just was just sat in my Jesus Christ take pose deck for it. I for, mean, come on, about it. And yeah, just, you know the musicianship. Um, I felt like Chris Cornell was like one of those singers that could sing like how he sung, and it was actually 
genuine and just like believable. yeah it wasn't cock rock no, at all no not at all and he especially wrote, like, temple really, of the dog when yeah. you get into that it's like what yeah. the fuck that is so honest so and organic good. exactly yeah and so um uh so i just remember meeting him for the first time and us playing we wrote a the first song we ever wrote we just was the first time we met was a song called light my way and i remember from that from like the first time he came in i was like oh fuck was it this was is, it did you guys call him like hey we're, we're looking to do something you know it was the three of us were over at rick rubin's house going like like you know because when you're not sure what to do or you're or you know you go to rick's house yeah yeah you know because yeah. he's always got he's always got ideas and, and uh, what is he throwing singers out like hey yeah, you gotta Rick's, try this guy or yeah, that guy i want to say it was rick rubin who's like Put bad motor finger on, and he Rick Rubin listens to music louder than anybody that I know. Yeah, and we're being blasted by his stereo that that no one's ever seen. Before. I was like, "What? This kind of a stereo exists?" Is yeah, insane. yeah, yeah. And I'm my face is being blown off by bad motor finger for like the nine thousandth thousandth time, and just going. Like, it was no brainer. It's like, oh, you think it would be a good idea for us to play with Chris Cornell? Yeah. Yeah, duh. Yeah, where, yeah. Where, where yeah. is he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Get him, and yeah. somehow... And he's just going to want to do it. You right, know? right. Like, him, for him to put in the piece, like, I'm yeah. already doing shit, you yeah. know? Yeah, And so it was incredible when he actually did come down, and then we were all of a sudden we're writing music, and we wrote music. We were such a prolific band, and we wrote music um, really quickly. Um... You know, but he was, yeah, he, he had hard times. He was going through hard times as well uh, d during that time. And we were just getting to know him. And, yeah. um, you know, before our record even came out, you know, we already had him in promises trying to get him, yeah. trying to get him clean. We already broke up. Yeah, I always say broke up before the first record even came out. Yeah, you do, you do the record we're, and we're, then you guys just break up. <laughs> we're just like, oh, oh. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's again. <laughs> and this again. Oh, cool. <laughs> Band dynamics. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, so that was frustrating because we had this record in the can and and then we weren't were in a band that felt like that was that was tough. Um, but we got it together. He got it together and and you know, we were able to make three records. Yeah. Um, and I just I love that man like at his core, he was like a really sweet thoughtful smart guy yeah and um he, a true artist you know he just um he felt the pain of like of of people like news was a hard hard thing for you know you could you could see it like physically um hurting him and taking on pain i think like in any artist and everyone i anyone i've ever played with has suffers from this i you take on the energy of, of like rooms of entire rooms sometimes and um, um, and you feel you feel the pain as much as you feel like the joy um, and and so that's what makes I think for really great art absolutely when you can feel that yeah yeah um, so it's a it's um, it, and it, it's, it's also what makes it so tough to just yeah. live on a daily basis without masking that or t taking drugs to try and maybe not feel that for one day yeah. or a few days. Yeah, it's a, that's a, uh, I still can't believe he's gone. I mean, I just cannot can't. believe that. Dude. I wake up some mornings and kind of forget about it. And it's like, oh. I know you guys played together like. Yeah, uh, yeah about a year. Y yeah. A little over a year ago. Yeah, so. man. We did. And, and. Uh, it felt it felt so great to be on stage with him again, and he talked about you know he wanted to do a tour, he wanted to make music, and yeah. I'm like, D fuck yes, this would be incredible. I love playing with you. I would love to make music with yeah. with you. Um, and unfortunately, it, you know, it, it it never happened, and and um, you know, he's gonna he will be great greatly missed. The the beauty of it is is that he he did leave so much work, yeah, amazing work behind and and we will always have that yeah yeah we got the music we got the music which is great yeah uh is rick how you got the sabbath gig you're playing with sabbath on the 13 record that is um i well, this is how this went down rick had asked um he said hey sharon osborne is going to give you a call yeah yeah and and ask if you you want to play the record and i'm just like and this was 
when they didn't have a bass player either. And I think they wanted me and Tim oh, wow. to do it. And Sharon Osbourne called when me and Tim were in a rehearsal studio one day. Geezer wasn't even... Uh, I don't think Geezer was even going to be a part of it yet. Holy shit. So it was going to be Tim and I. Wow. And I remember talking to, talking to Sharon and my words uh, to Sharon was, you know what? Um, those are really big shoes to, to, to fill. Yeah. And more than anything... I want to see Geezer and Bill Ward do this record. and I, I You were re- telling her that? Yeah, I was like, I, I really hope, as much as I would be honored and it would be the most amazing experience to make a Black Sabbath record, you know, with, 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 uh, with Tony and Ozzy, uh, please just try and get it together with those guys and, yeah. and, and make a record. That was the end of the conversation. Nine months go by, and I call up Rick. I'm talking to Rick, and... Uh, I'm like, what's going on with that Sabbath thing? He's like, oh, you know, funny enough, I think they're going to start auditioning drummers, and I think Geezer's in. Um, and I'm like, really? But Bill Ward? Yeah. He's not going to do it. He's like, yeah, you should come down and play, because you know what? If you don't do it, some other drummer is going to do it. Yeah. So you should come down and audition. And so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go and audition. So I went down to Ozzy's house, played in a room, um, quarter of this room like from that door right there you know it's like a room tiny tiny room yeah with there, the band with the band with the whole band oh at his house at ozzy's house right. in like a studio yeah yeah like a tiny studio and rage is a fucking loud band tim yeah. has the loudest bass amp i've ever heard in my life yeah they were louder wow. it was the, like tony's amp was the loudest thing i ever <laughs> heard in my life and it was literally like three feet away from me and i'm getting blasted and these are my heroes what song did they play um, we played War Pigs, of course. Yeah, Dirty Women. Oh, Dirty Women. Which Whoa, was, I was like, Whoa, oh, you got to get your double bass out. Whoa, he's like, bring your double bass. Yeah, I haven't played double bass since fucking Greta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I played double bass. Like, Dur- Dirty Women. Bit. Wow. Yeah, Dirty Women and um, God damn it. Oh, and then new songs. Oh, new songs. This song called God Is Dead. Oh yeah, yeah. And this uh, song called Loner. Whatever. And so yeah. So I so we wound up doing that. I left and I was just like, I was shitting my pants, yeah. dude. I'm really shitting my pants. I'm like, what the fuck? I can't believe I'm even in a room right. with these guys. Um, and you're just doing, did you just play them each once? Or they're like, this sounds good. Let's try it again. Played each one and I was like a pool of fucking sweat. <laughs> and, um, and just going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm fucking playing with Sabbath. And, and then... It ends, and I was just like, you know, classic, just fucking lying. I was like, you know, I just, if this is like the, if this is as far as this goes, just like, thank you so much. It was incredible. It was a dream come true to yeah. play with you guys. Um, I, I leave. Um, they start playing I, with other drummers. I think Abe Laborio was one of them. Whoa, and, Abe. And, yeah, yeah, who's Whoa. fucking, I love Abe. Oh, he's and killer. Fucking killer. I went to, Abe was going to school at Dick Grove, uh-huh. same time I was. So I knew Abe from, from, from way back then. And I can't remember. Other drummers were trying out. And I remember, um, I got a call, another call back. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm going to play with Sabbath twice. Wow. Went in and just did the best I could. Yeah. Left. Smile on my face. Okay. That, I mean, if that's the last time, it's great. Got another call back. I'm like, oh, my God. Don't do this to me. Three times. Just, yeah. Yeah. Like, fuck. And they're still not saying <laughs> we're going to make a record. Yeah. Um, they're not saying what it is or anything. They're just kind of like come down and play. No, no. I knew they were going to make a record. Right. They weren't saying, okay, you you got the gig. We're going to make a record. Right. I was just being auditioned just like anything else. Yeah. Like anybody else. And uh, and I think by like the fourth one, and Rick was there, Rick was like, okay, we got 16 songs and we're about a weekend. We're going to do this for another five days and then we're going to go record the song. Oh. The songs. And I was like, what yeah so you're, you're telling me that i'm, I'm gonna be recording these songs he's like yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're gonna go do it and i was just fucking and they were all so fucking nice ozzy's like if you need to sleep at the house he's like you can sleep in your kick drum he's like you can stay here as long as you want are they recording it at ozzy's house they weren't recording but he's like if you need to come here because my my kit was set up there right he was just so fucking cool he's like do whatever you need to do and and and, t- and tony and Giza were so fucking cool wow and i was also like the new guy so i was constantly being fucked with which was oh, oh which yeah was really fucking yeah. great it was like i felt like i could like finally calm down and it was amazing we went and we made the record at, at shangri-la 
uh, Studios, which is in in Malibu, Rick's studio. Oh yeah, that place is amazing. It's amazing, right? and we made it. You know, no. That's like Dylan's tracks. joint, or, or exactly. Yeah, the band, yeah, the and, band. And yeah, leave on um, all that stuff out there. That's where the Avid Brothers uh, did that record. Oh man, yeah, incredible band too. Yeah. So so we wound up making the whole record there. Every day I was there, the whole band was there. And, uh, you know, it was like decent Are you guys hours. just tracking live? Tracking live. No shit. The whole time. Yeah. Wow. And, and it was just. How long did it take you to just fucking start going like, okay, I, I'd like to shake off that Sabbath right there. Yeah. Um, I mean, you yeah. know what I yeah, mean? You're I was like trying to figure, like, get over, like, this is a dream come true. And yeah. it's like, okay, you know, I'm just in a room with these guys and everything's going to be fine. I think it was the. The second song we recorded was God is Dead. Yeah. And it's a long, epic song. And I'm just trying to remember the fucking parts at this point because there's 16 other songs. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, with my fucking papers and my fucking notes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. like a guy that likes to come in prepared. Right. So I don't have to think at all. Yeah, because that's the, once you start thinking, then you start losing groove and, totally. and, and, and you're not there. Totally. So I have to not really be thinking when I'm playing. It's like the whole Zen, whatever, fucking right. um, uh, Taoist approach, which is just you can't be thinking when you're playing. So I would be cramming outside in the backyard. By, by the way, the coolest thing about recording there was I would go outside and I would look down to the beach, Zuma, Lifeguard 6, yeah. where I would fucking hang out as a teenager with my ghetto blaster, blasting fucking Ozzy and Sabbath. That's and crazy. Halen, like right there. Isn't that nuts? Like full circle it, for you. Full circle moment going, wow, this is fucking life is funny. <laughs> yeah, life, life is funny. Is and weird, like, wow, right? I'm so lucky to be doing this. Um, but anyway, so The God is Dead, we, we, it was like the first take, and it just like some, something else was... Channel like something yeah it was a channeling whatever that is that when you're an artist you know when you're just not thinking and you become bigger than oh yeah then you're that, fucking that's who what you are. that becomes heaven like yeah. gigs like if I'm doing stand up and things all start to happen and then all of a sudden you're like I'm just floating right yeah. here like you like, feel closer to God whatever uh, that is it, whatever it, God it's is some kind of pure form yeah. of like is 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 rain into you and you're going like this is happening that's it so ironically the song where I felt closest God to God is as dead. an artist <laughs> was a song called God is Dead <laughs> and that's how it happened and I just remember. After that happened, I remember walking outside and and I'm having a conversation with Tony and Tony's like, oh yeah, you know, you're you, you're, you're kind of like a bloke now. He's like, yeah. And then he starts talking about like possibly going on tour oh. and stuff. And I'm like, oh, now why God. didn't you do the tour? I mean, well, it fucking broke my heart because well, listen, I'm a drummer. Uh, I'm I'm a freak on drummers. Yeah. I'm a freak on drummers. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you're a drummer. That's why I'm not a drummer. Well, you play drums, but but I but I'm saying it, it, there's a thing, man. There's a thing. Phil Rudd, ACDC, <sighs> King. There's a thing. You know what I mean? King. Adler, GNR. There's a swing King. thing that right. So that's it. You know. Yeah. You so do know what's. You up. know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So other guys are great. And the way I know is I've played with many drummers and with my music, and it, it, some would be like, oh, my God. Steve from the Black Crows, you know? Yeah. He just did ACDC with us. He fucking has it, you know? Yeah. These guys that have it. Love that. So what happened there? Well, you know, I hope no one gets mad at me for yeah. saying this, but I don't think I've ever really talked about it. Um, but... So I thought I was actually going to go on tour with them. Right. So I spent my entire Christmas relearning like the Sabbath catalog. Yeah. And I'm like, this is incredible. Um, by the way, it didn't matter. It just made me a better drummer again because now I'm now I'm really have a microscope under Bill Ward, who's one of the greatest, you know. Yeah. Uh, like metal hole drummers in the of sky, all time. man. Hole in the sky. When you hear hole him play the sky that is shit. one of the. That's one of my favorite it's Sabbath insane, songs. Insane, man. It almost sounds like Jane's Addiction. Like I hear Jane's just his, right. his vo vocal range and everything. Totally. One of my favorite Sabbath songs, Hole in the Sky. So I'm excited, super excited. Um, but what had happened was, I believe, is that. Tony asked me to be in the band before he had a real conversation with Ozzy. Right. And I think Ozzy always intended to have the guy, uh, fuck, what's Tony, his name? I think it's Tony. Clue Photos, right? Uh, yeah. 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 He, al he always intended to have him, one, make the record and do the tour. And so 
they, you know, so I think the Ozzy was probably pretty, pretty put out that he was asking me to, to be in the band right. without necessarily. So then you already lose because it's a power trip. The Even power though trip. they're back together, it's like, you don't make the decisions. Yeah. And, and how funny is this? I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm caught between like a rift between the singer yeah. and the guitar player. Yeah, again. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking classic. I had, I had Rick talking to me. I had uh, the heads of like Universal calling me going, listen, just call Ozzy. Give him a call. Yeah. And see, he's like, maybe you just play like LA, New York, uh, you know, London, Chicago, you know, just do a few shows. Just, just talk to Ozzy. I'm like, really? I, I feel really uncomfortable calling him. Yeah. Like and doing this. I'm, I, I just don't, I feel really weird. Just, like, just please, no, I think you should really call him. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, fuck okay yeah so i'm sitting there at my house and i'm like it's like you know calling the girlfriend where you dial every number but the last yeah time. yeah yeah like, yeah fuck am i really gonna fucking do this and like what i'm gonna what beg him to be in fucking fuck black Sabbath? i mean you gotta do it though right? like, i gotta do it you so just I, played on the record it just, just makes sense and i'm like and it was amazing and i i wanted to do it so i so so i i fucking hit the last number ozzy picks up i'm like hey ozzy How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> it's Brad. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah, what, what's, what's going on? And I'm like, listen, I just wanted to talk to you. Um, I just wanted to say, fuck, making the record was a fucking dream come true to me. Amazing, amazing experience. I'm just wondering how you feel about me playing with you because I think there's really something special that happened and it's a chemistry that doesn't really necessarily come around. You can have great players, but something happened when we played um, yeah. that I felt really strong about and I think everyone felt strong about it and um, and then he launches into also he's kind of hard to understand sometimes right yeah. he's talking I, about hey, I don't so, know so he launches yeah. into that and he launches into about the rift between uh, Tony never asking him oh, wow. before he asked me and I'm a fucking no and fucking does that, does that to me as he's talking yeah the fucking reception starts going off out on the phone. Oh no! So I'm oh, only no! getting so I'm only getting a quarter of the story. Yeah. I, uh, and then out. And all of a sudden, I took, uh, oh no! And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, you don't even know why you're okay. not doing it now because so of bad AT and T. Yeah, yeah. So now, so, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> fuck Pac Bell. Yeah. I moved to Scott Pager. So now I'm so mortified because yeah. I'm like, oh, once again, I'm like, oh, once again, I'm on the phone with this guy who's going off on the fucking off on on the guitar player or whatever happened yeah and, and i just like in my body i couldn't take it anymore yeah so i'm like ozzy ozzy i'm like wait a second wait a second listen all good i just wanted to say fucking awesome record i can't believe i got to do that with you yeah um i if 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 you ever want to fucking play a show together know that i'm fucking there to do it have a fucking great tour and i fucking love you bye oh. <laughs> see you later i couldn't take it anymore man no. and it was mostly that the fucking the phone would kept cutting out yeah and what am i going to do start it like yeah like hey uh, breaking up breaking up can <laughs> yeah. you hit a what landline did you, what did you say again <laughs> yeah. i'm only getting out hey, the conversation hey, fire me again i did <laughs> hey it was breaking up could you fire me again <laughs> oh my I god didn't, dude. i didn't hear it the first time could you imagine yeah, so so dude, it, that's an insane story yeah, and so it never it never happened but i gotta say man the record was enough for me and as much yeah. as i would have loved and I don't regret going back to that Black Sabbath catalog. Whatever. Yeah, not at During all. Christmas, it was all... Yeah. It was, it was what all a great story. Been. There it is. I mean, not a good one, because man, was I bummed. Oh, man. Just so for my own... Just for my own... I was. Pissed off. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> like, Come I, on! I appreciate that, and it would have been incredible to do. Well, the swing in that Sabbath would have been great. That was you know, the yeah. swing. I'm not knocking Tony or whatever. No, but, he's an incredible metal drummer. Like but people guy. play different, you know. That's yeah. more of a bam, bam, of a, of a pa, boom, ba, ba. When you get into the finesse and stuff, of uh, that's one, like I said early on in this interview, one of the greatest things about Rage is the drumming. It's what drives this fucking thing and makes it feel so cool. It's got a boogie to it, you know? It's well, that's as, really nice as, of you uh, to say. As dumb Thank as you. that sounds. Like, it's got a it's boogie got a to boogie. it, man. Well, like swing. It's swing. It's swing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's something crazy. 
And and uh, I love when I love when when sentences start with "Here's something crazy." <laughs> yeah, I did want to I did want to finish this one thing though with you because yeah, I always no wondered was one of the meltdowns of rage was when Tim threw his. Uh, or, or Tim had that it climbed up on the thing at MTV. I don't. I want to say no. I think that that was might have been a straw that broke the camel's back. I can't, but and I know that it was bizarre when it happened because right. um, we were all sitting there. MTV like gave us a bunch of bottles of champagne, and you know Tim, you know obviously was taking that taking it pretty seriously. Yeah. And to be honest, we weren't like big, we weren't fans of Limp Biscuit. Right. We felt you know. The only thing we were fans of was like they, they were actually getting it together to like write music and play and, and do things. And we were having a, a, a rough time right. at the time. Anyways, it seemed like in Tim's eyes that we were that they were going to give us this award. Right. And Tim's head. Right. And so Limp Biscuit wins the award for best video for break stuff. Michael Moore is sitting right next to us, who, who made one of the greatest videos. We literally shut down the New York Stock Exchange. Incredible. Incredible video. Incredible. Monumental. Man. Monumental. And Monumental. And and not only that, but he had made these great documentaries. Correct. So the combination of you two and this message and everything, it's Correct. like, hell yeah, this is some... But then you're dealing with MTV, dealing with who MTV. doesn't understand art. That, who and, doesn't understand art. Yeah, so the lesson in life is like never expect anything. Yeah. Yeah. And just never expect anything. And so Limp Biscuit wins, gets called up, and, and, and I remember sitting next to Tim, and Tim sitting next to, to uh, Michael, and he's like, I, I want to fu fucking go up there. I want to go up there. And I remember, and he's like, he, look, he looks over Michael, and he goes, he goes I, I want to go up there. I want to go up there. And, and, and I think there were other people in the band going, no. You're like, no, 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 no don't, don't do anything. And Michael Moore just goes, just go with it. Go with your heart. Oh my and God! Literally, Laura. Tim's Tim's with the lighter wearing, fluid. And Tim's wearing flip flops, and I see Tim get up and starts walking over over the chairs. Yeah. And I'm elated at this point because yeah. I just love shit like this. Yeah. And I'm like, this is fucking gonna be good. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's gonna be fucking good. <laughs> and he fucking actually makes it to the stage. Yeah. And then starts climbing this tower that starts Unbe shaking. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I'm like. This is good, yeah. but someone might die now. Yeah, somebody might get hurt. Someone might get really hurt. And he's like shaking this thing and Fred's looking at him and I'm still like in awe. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. And I'm like, st I'm like standing up like I'm at the, like the greatest sporting event that I've like ever, ever <laughs> yeah, fucking yeah. seen. The Montana Dwight Clark catch. It was incredible. <laughs> and meanwhile, MTV is trying to divert the attention because the stage is broken up in two parts. Right. So they cut to a commercial mayhem ensues like absolute fucking mayhem and so we get up out of our seat and we're trying to get to tim yeah and i remember tom and i just being in a fucking swarm of fucking people and it's almost impossible to get to tim there's an undercover cop there older dude who got on a ladder to try and get timmy i remember watching this vividly the guy tries to fucking grab at Tim and he's yeah. an undercover cop. Yeah. So he's just in regular clothes. Tim literally grabs the dude's white fucking mustache and kind of like pulls on it. <laughs> 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 and I, I'm dying oh. right now. I'm like, this is fucking incredible. Oh. Oh. MTV. Meanwhile, there's a second part of the stage. Yeah. Come back from the commercial. And what was it? One of the Wayne brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Standing yeah. there like, <laughs> Like just wide eyed going, what the fuck? And then tries to act like nothing's going on. Yeah. And, and that added to the hilarity of it. I'm like, this is the fucking better than the, like a vaudeville fucking yeah. uh, thing gone, gone wrong. And um, so they're trying to act like everything's fine. Meanwhile, off camera, there's an absolute riot. Wow. Fucking riot happening. And they finally got him down and we were all thrown outside and MTV hated us. And they're like, I remember the, the head guy at mtv was there as we were being ushered out yeah the like, viacom thank you dude. very much don't come back wow that type of thing and yeah. i just remember feeling like like just laughing my ass off in the van back to the hotel <laughs> just going that was and what a dick it made the show great it, it, totally. it made the show great it, totally. it made people it's all those the cobain axle fight totally the uh uh, what, what's his name throwing his bass in the air you know oh, yeah, yeah. knocking himself out all yeah. those things are everything we remember exactly but when it's happening they, so they don't usually yeah. have the foresight but then when they when 
you know, when they see that people are into it and it brings them more attention, then they're okay with yeah, it. Yeah, and of course. Like, oh, yeah, this, yeah. Was, this was great. What? We actually set this up. We meant for this to happen. So was that <laughs> that was the the straw that broke the camel's not, back? That, I don't know. Yeah, not not really. I just think it was. I just think it was something that was like, you know, uh, maybe people were bummed out on. You yeah, know, that, that happened. But it, but but looking back on it, the yeah. four of us, yeah, yeah. laugh our fucking asses <laughs> off at it. You know, we were just in a tough place at that yeah, time, yeah, yeah, so it yeah, was yeah. easy to look at that and go, oh, fuck this. I get it. Yeah. You uh, you hit me a couple days ago, You said, and you said, hey, you had a lot to talk about. You, you listened to my um, podcast and uh, talk about diabetes and stuff. Yeah. I got diabetes so two you, years ago, wow. uh, in May 1st. Wow. Uh, type 2. Self-inflicted. Type two. Self-inflicted. Yeah. Brought, yeah. M- made myself a garbage can. <laughs> you know, it's... You're, you're type 1. I'm actually type 1. And um, uh, when do you find out that you're type 1 in your life? I found out I was, t- I was 29 years old and we were on tour with U2. Pop the, Mart tour. Oh man, how so, great was that fucking Empire tour? Thing. It was. It was oh. incredible. It was weird, you know, playing at like Coliseum and being in it. Yeah, the lemon. The lemon. We saw them get get caught in the fucking lemon. Stuck in the lemon. Spinal I mean, tap. I mean, it was the biggest <laughs> tap moment. I will say this: they, you two, went from, um, just lost act that were just didn't have it together, and yeah. it was, I felt actually bad. Yeah. Um, because it it wasn't good. Within two weeks, they were like the greatest band I had ever seen. Like when they finally got all of the production together, yeah, man, that band is. I love that. Tour. I saw them. I saw them at the Country Club, like Whoa. fucking in in in. High Whoa! School. No shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a Country Club. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is on like, like the fucking first record. Really, really early on. But they're a band. Another classic band of, of being. You know, the their their sum is greater than their parts and they're all incredible they're also a band that i hated at first yeah you know what i mean because it yeah. was like uh you know it was like oh man what is this and became one of my yeah. favorite bands of and also yeah. i saw uh public enemy and the sugar cubes open for them on the octung wow, baby that's a fucking you know so they they, they, right they brought killer bands out too and yeah. uh what an insane thing. So you're out All on right, the tour. So, so I'm out with them on the Pop Mart tour. Everything's everything's fine. Halfway through the tour, um, I'm in a hotel room. Mine came on like suddenly and it came on like a pack of wolves. Yeah, that happened me. to me too. And so I go to bed. Yeah. And I wake up like nine times in the night having to fucking urinate. Oh, yeah. During Halfway through the night, I felt like I had the worst hangover I'd ever had. It didn't even, I had maybe a beer. Right. I'm um, like, what the? And, and I'm urinating and I didn't fucking drink shit. I'm like, what the fuck is going on yeah. with me? I wake up in the morning. My eyesight has diminished by 35%. Whoa. Everything is fucking blurry. Whoa. So at this point, I'm like a fucking, um, I'm in complete fucking denial at this point. I'm like, I'm like, oh, fuck, I need glasses. This is, <laughs> oh, no. This is crazy. I can't even in see In one Tom. night. Yeah, in yeah, one yeah. night. Yeah, in you one can't night. see 35. I'm like, I need glasses. Right. Like, I, need, I, need glasses. <laughs> I can't yeah. even see Tom. Right. Right. Like, yeah, I'm all good. Yeah, the urination thing was just, an, uh, yeah. whatever, that, whatever to that. I, oh just, I just know I need glasses. <laughs> and so... <coughs> so I finished that tour off. You just keep going? I just keep going. I finished the tour oh. off, and during that tour, I start, like, I'm already, like, a, I, I'm, you know, I wasn't a overweight or anything. I'm, like, pretty skinny dude. Then I started losing mass amounts of weight. So then I became emaciated. Yeah. Right after that tour, I was actually playing with John Doe at the time as oh, well. Wow. From X, who, yeah. who I, I love. Um, and I remember going straight from that tour straight to John Doe yeah, and playing some shows. And I remember being in San Francisco and, and just going, wow, I really don't feel, I feel so lethargic. And yeah. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm going to go get a burrito. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, need, I need some energy. <laughs> I'm so lethargic. San Francisco, the immediate food that uh, you thought of. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go get a fucking killer burrito. Yeah. I'm going to eat burrito. Loaded with carbs. Loaded, loaded with carbs. And, and then when I got home, I'm like, okay, I got to go to the eye doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I got to get my eyes fixed. Holy shit, this so is hilarious. The, yeah, so I go to the fucking eye doctor. I'm like, oh, I feel really weird. They do some tests. They're like, you know what? Everything you're telling me, you better go see your doctor. So I go see my doctor, and he's like, you either have some crazy um, uh, autoimmune dysfunction or it's type 1 diabetes, whatever, same thing. 
And um and sure enough, it was type one diabetes. Yeah. And I knew nothing about this. It's was it in your family? Not in my family. Right. My grandma was a type two diabetic. That's all. Yeah. Only only thing I had in my that I had in my family. So I was straight on to insulin. Yeah. Straight had a tour and immediately immediately i have you know i have tendencies of ocd so i was testing my blood oh yeah is like it, it every two hours so with me so i heard every that you were doing this i'm like oh yeah. okay yeah it's really the best thing you could do i knew exactly what all foods were doing to me. exactly and i was like oh, this is the, and, so and you know what the worst part was what's that no one was telling me anything. The doctor goes, yeah, I don't Doctors, know, get some brochures. I don't know fucking shit. I go, what do you mean get some brochures? You know, it's, it's going to be 800 bucks. I go, I don't have that kind of fucking money a month for, for pills or anything. Ridiculous. And then he goes, well, hire a nutritionist. I go, dude, Same thing. I'm a hire goddamn a fucking comedian. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> you, I think <laughs> the most uh, great, great thing is too, and, and you know, like when I talked about it, like uh, people are like, yeah, man, I can't believe you only talked about diabetes when, you know, yeah. uh, and it's like, hey, dude, if I don't talk about it, people don't know because no one is talking about it. No you one's know? talking about it. And it's an epidemic. It's fucking epidemic. Everybody fucking out there. country. I could tell how many people coming. email me like, hey, yeah. what did you feel like? What happened? Yeah. What did you do? Yeah. I mean, we're a nation addicted to sugar, without a doubt. It's crazy. Um, so that's that doesn't help things at and all. And when you test yourself every couple hours, yeah. you start to be you figure out food maps. You realize... Exactly. You yeah. realize what the foods you're eating do to you and how they affect your blood sugars yeah. and, and a timeline for yeah. that as well. Right. And so so I got so into that yeah. and I was I was really fucking hard on myself. Yeah. And I and I'm like literally go I have to go out on tour. I think that it, we went to fucking Israel like yeah. right after I I uh, came down with Israel and maybe Japan or something. And I just like had the biggest backpack in the world and I was eating my, making my own food. And yeah. I was just like super hard on myself about What'd it. What'd you switch to? Did you go vegan or what'd you do? Um, I, there was a, a point where I went vegan. That's what I did to reset myself. Yeah, and then I also talked to a nutritionist and she's like, oh, you should be eating oatmeal in the morning. I do that. Maybe an egg. But for me, for a type one diabetic, that's, yeah. that's not what you should be doing. Because, oh yeah? Because... Oatmeal is super high in carbs. Like I should be eating like eggs and like protein. I know you're too, like you know the whole keto diet is really popular right now. But, I don't do keto. Yeah, but I, I it's like something that's that's catching on. Right. Yeah. For me, the high protein or that keto style diet, I've actually been doing for for years. Right. And for being a type one, where I'm actually shooting insulin yep. and I'm my own doctor. Yeah. It's what works best for me. Right. So what? So let's let's go through a day of eating for you. So no oatmeal. Right. The reason I do oatmeal yeah. was it was a steel cut because it seemed to be a slow burner and it, it kept me uh, kind of stable for hours. Well, here, here's the difference between you and I. Yeah. You you thankfully uh -huh. do have a working pancreas. Right. Now. Right. Right. So you can actually um, you can actually do that stuff and it would, it's it actually probably is good for you right My, when you're a type 1 diabetic your pancreas does not work at all right so i'm basically just dealing with insulin injections and i'm old school like i don't want to wear a pump i don't want to do anything yeah, any yeah. because i just don't i don't want to maybe you just shoot through. it into your leg yeah and nothing against pumps because there's a lot of people that swear by it yeah i think it's great so yeah i shoot it in my yeah leg um mostly that's what i do um so let, let's go through your diet you get okay. up in the morning and you, I, when you get up in the morning, do you shoot yourself up, uh, like, because uh, you you I, got you, you've been sleeping? All right, two different kinds of insulin. There's a long acting insulin and there's a short acting insulin. Yeah. The long act, acting insulin um, is a 24 hour uh, insulin that's like a basal that keeps you like uh, good throughout the day. Yeah, I split that up into two shots. I do most. I do. Uh, a bigger shot of it in the morning and a smaller shot of it um, at night. Right. And I'm really sensitive to insulin. I have this weird thing, which isn't normal. I haven't had to... Um, it's a degenerative disease. So generally, you have to... The, the longer you have it, the Go more up. insulin you have to take. I'm on the same amount of insulin that I had when I started. And I forget the medical term as to why... I why that is for me. Yeah. But I'm super sensitive to insulin and I, and I don't have to take that much of it. Anyway, so... Long, I, I take the one shot in the morning, then I go make ki I go make my kids breakfast. Oh, and, and, oh, oh, but you don't eat. Yeah, I don't really eat. I'll, I'll have some I'll have some coffee. Right. Take my kids. I, now, do you drink decaf? 
No, I drink regular coffee. Well, that's crazy because they say caffeine is horrible for diabetes, but coffee is great for it. Yeah. Because of the oils in the beans. Right. Because so, I'm missing caffeine yeah. big time. Oh, so you, t- you cut it out. Yeah. So for me... Um, I went crazy. No sugar, no uh, that's flour, a, that's no great. white rice, no uh, caffeine. That's great. That's, that's really great. I, I cut it's not most great, of it out. It, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it yeah. sucks, but it actually yeah. really is yeah, great yeah. for your body. Yeah. And, and I do the same, but I do have a cup of coffee in the morning, okay. maybe two cups of coffee. Uh-huh. Um, it, so I'll, I'll bring, get my kids to school, then I'll come home and I'll eat like egg whites or even a f- full eggs. A lot of avocado because it's yeah. like good, good Love fat. It. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes I'll eat bread and I try to do like eat, bread. Yeah, yeah. And I'll you try gluten free, gluten. What's oh, that? Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel yeah, Ezekiel bread? is really good. Yeah. Anything like gluten, any type of gluten free bread. I went and did a. Um, I actually went and did a. Uh, uh, an allergy test, uh-huh. and I'm not actually allergic to wheat. Yeah, according to this test, and so sometimes I'll even have a fucking croissant because I fucking like croissants. Man. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Because <laughs> they're good. I love croissants. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're real. They're real good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love it. You look away. You go because no. they're good. Yeah, the fucking the French. You know, they got that. That and the French fries. They, they got that down. Um, so it's, that's and then for lunch I'll eat like. So and eggs and avocado. Eggs, avocados, and then like kale, spinach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vegetables. Yeah. Um, and then I'll have like a green drink, a cold-pressed green I drink. I do that That's every day. That's my thing, man. I, I do. For whatever reason, when I, when I go on tour and I don't have that, like by the time I get home, oh. and I actually do it, and, I, and it goes into my body, I can actually feel my body just like yeah. opening I up. I go green drink every day, sometimes twice Best. a day. That's great. It's yeah. bad. I think I think that's a, a really good thing. And everybody's body is different. So totally. what works for me doesn't, you know, may not work. It doesn't. For you got to figure it out. Yeah. And then lunch, I'll do like uh, turkey, um, avocado again. Yeah. Um, a whole avocado. Just eat a whole raw avocado. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I love I it. Will and and yeah, I'm not like vegan or vegetarian right now. I really would like to be. Yeah, me too. Uh, but it's just tough. It, it is. I miss meat. I was just in Nashville. Yeah, I fucked up some meat. Yeah, I bet. that's a good place to fuck up meat. I go, I, <laughs> I go what I call Deegan. I'm vegan unless I'm in historic landmarks of meat. There you- Austin, <laughs> Oakland, uh, you know Nashville. Yeah, uh, uh, Kansas City, barbecue cities, they know Toronto. What to do in Kansas you know, City for sure. yeah, right. Yeah, Deegan. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So then you go some turkey. I do a lot of yeah for lunches. I'm always you like, going any brown or, rice, turkey or chicken, like a or just like a salad. I do. I don't do brown rice that much. Right. I'll do quinoa. Quinoa. I do it all, yeah, every day. I'm into quinoa. I love it. That's a really good. Is quinoa good for you? Yeah. For your for your diabetes, yeah, it's good it, for me. It fills me up totally, and it has it has a, a good amount of protein in it. Yeah. Yeah. As well, and then and then for dinner. And, you know, and I, I always like to do organic, as much organic stuff as Absolutely. I can, because, man, yeah, you, fuck, this It's just like, so much bullshit like, in our food. Oh, dude. It's really... Look, dude, I dropped 40. It's a nightmare. That's incredible. You yeah, know what you I mean? Great. I mean, That's... before you and I on the couch, I would be almost next to you. <laughs> <laughs> you done real good. Yeah, You yeah. done good, man. It's, it's, a, it's a feat, and yep. I'm, I'm sure you feel... A million times better. You know, the only thing I uh, miss, I would say, is caffeine. Because since I'm off candy, which yeah. kept me charged at a certain level all day. Yeah. Just a zooming. Yeah. I like to be That's up funny. zooming. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just zzz. Yeah. I like to be sizzling in that See, bump that, of... Do you know what the sizzling really was? It was, yeah. It was your blood sugar at like probably I, 350 I, I and you were know. literally burning blood in I your know. body. I know. Isn't that weird? It's fucking crazy. So now that I'm off all of that, yeah. I'm 52. Yeah. Now I'm kind of... Like uh, mellow for me, yeah. mellow. Yeah, 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 and I miss the cooking. It's a buzz. I well, miss the cooking. Well, why can't you have coffee? Well, I, 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 I'm the type of guy that took it so fucking serious that it said caffeine is not really good for God, uh, some stuff you read. You're like, oh, right, not stuff different. I read. Now I didn't really uh, test myself with caffeine because I had just quit it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have a little caffeine and see what, but uh, man, I, sometimes the guy will make, give me caffeine by accident yeah. at the fucking coffee shop. I'll be yeah. like decaf. Right. And he'll be like, 
Hey, yeah. And I'm like, you're guessing. Oh my yeah. God, this fucking guy's guessing. That's and great I'll, for you. Yeah. No, but then I have it and I'm yeah. like, wait. Bouncing off. Oh my God. It's like a bat, like back when you first do Coke, your first bump, you're like, whoa my God. <laughs> way back over way back then. Yeah, I don't do any of that shit anymore. Yeah, but no, man, man, fuck that. It's yeah. But I would, you know, you gotta you gotta find your own path, but I would say yeah. fucking a cup of coffee a day. Is yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know. I hear you. Uh, yeah, I drink like three a day decaf, what and about, it's got a little bit of caffeine, so fine. What about green tea? To say it's I bad love for you it. too. Yeah, okay, there you but go. But I drink the decaf green tea. Oh, what's the point? I know, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. I, I was like that. I didn't do coffee for a really long time. Then I just started doing it because I, I didn't yeah. drink like four cups. I would just drink one. Yeah, when I drank yeah, four, yeah. it would totally affect my insulin. Totally. I would have like... Uh, yeah. crashes and then it would go super yeah, high yeah yeah fuck that so so you just gotta be careful and you invented a lemonade is that true I did man is it so, out there okay so no it's not out, out there anymore necessarily um, the brand isn't out there anymore so when I came down with it I would go into Whole Foods and I would try and find a drink yeah. that was like healthy I could drink. At this time, yeah, there was nothing back then. Nothing. I, every fucking juice that I picked There's up. There's no LaCroix. Nothing. None of that. None of that. It was just. Fuck. Everything I picked up, 35 grams of sugar. Crazy. It's the same amount of a fucking, as a fucking Coke. Crazy, right? And so I was really frustrated. And um, the person I was with at the time um, was working at this health food store. <laughs> And she was like, have you ever tried Stevia? You know what Stevia is? Yeah. And I'm like, what's Stevia? And I'm like, you know, like looking up Stevia and getting information. Oh, it just so happens that Stevia is a plant that's been around for over 2,000 fucking years. Yeah. Uh, originates in South America. And the reason why you don't see it uh, very much is because the fucking FDA, the fucking Devil's Association. Yeah, yeah, right. Have, hasn't approved it. And so you just don't, you just don't see it. So I got a hold of Stevia, and I just started making my own lemonade. Yeah. And I would have friends come over, and this stuff was killer. It's all about like having good water, yep. organic lemons, and the Stevia. And Stevia, more and more, they're learning how to, how to get the bitterness out of it yeah. and have like the, the sweet part of it. A lot of people just don't like it, though. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually like it, too. So I liked it so much, and the, and the friends that I would invite, invite over liked it so much that I like very naively went, Fuck! I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking start a fucking a juice company. Yeah, because I'm really into this and I and I really want to like educate people and yeah, I'm gonna. I'm the same know, way. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna be revolutionary and I'm gonna be fucking, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna educate people on on especially like diabetics too on this stuff. A lot of people are drinking. Do you drink diet drinks? You do. I used to. Not so, anymore. I don't drink any of that bullshit okay. at all. I quit that no six. Diet so, Coke was a demon. Yeah, aspartame. Like, that's the worst. I, I think Donald Rumsfeld is behind fucking aspartame. Dude, when I came off aspartame, yeah. I fell over in a, a yard. I was out working out. And I go, I'm quitting I Diet Coke. This. And I, I quit for like th at three days, and I was out running, and I just fell on a guy's lawn, and I was Crazy. like, oh, I'm having a heart attack. Call the ambulance, really they scary. brought me in. And the doctor was like, yeah, you had a massive panic attack. You Fuck. done anything differently? I go, oh, yeah, I quit Diet Coke. I've been drinking it like 15 years. He goes, oh, get ready for the ride. Yeah, yeah. And he just looked at <laughs> me like, terrible. get Fuck. ready for the ride. And for three weeks, it was brutal. That's Coming fucking... out of my body, same with sugar. Quitting yeah. sugar, ooh. Well, you can thank Donald Rumsfeld for the aspartame Fuck addiction. That. And, you know, it's like the aspartame is causing cancer in fucking lab rats, but still the FDA pushed it through. Yeah, 100%. Because, it's all you know, good. Yeah, yeah. It's all, <laughs> it's all good. Dicks. But this is kind of a gross story, but I, the one diet drink that I dug, I didn't drink diet drinks until I got diabetes and yeah. uh, was into Diet Dr. Pepper. I'm like, this almost tastes like real Dr. Pepper. Yeah, yeah. So I fucking, I, I, I would drink that every once in a while. I went and got my one time, I went and got a colonic. Oh, yeah. I went and get a colonic. And I'm doing the fucking colonic. This is really gross, but you yes. can see like you're literally your shit fucking coming out. And I see this shit that's literally gr glowing neon green. No. And I turn to Lana and I go, what the fuck is this? And she goes, oh, did you have any, any diet drinks lately? And I'm uh, like, yeah, I did. Yeah. I had Dr. Pepper. She goes, that's what that is. Whoa. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I, that day I never had a, oh. never had a, a diet drink again. Anyway, so... I started this company, um, and I was actually the first person in the United States to have 
a, a drink in the beverage section that was not in the sub, uh, supplement section, but yeah. it was in the beverage section that was sweetened with only stevia. Wow. Um, and it was at, in Whole Foods. And because I was, I was on this before the FDA even approved the shit. On, right. I, I think in 08. I think is when they finally approved it, um, or maybe it's 05. I can't remember. I'm so bad with with dates. But um, but I was that was a pretty cool thing. Like I feel like oh, I'm doing, that's awesome. I'm doing something really good. It wound up costing so much money, and I wound up going to these like these uh, natural uh, food. Um, uh, what you call it when they have the big uh, like conventions? Conventions exactly. And hoping to sell it and get yeah. it like mass out yeah, there. Yeah, and the natural foods, everyone seemed to like, oh, yeah, this is fucking great. I would go to the diabetes ones as well, and they just didn't give a fuck. It was so really they just wanted their diet cooks, and they just, it was so, so that's it was, fucking crazy. So it was a little hard for me because I'm like trying to learn help diabetic and people, and, and they're like, we're these, good, we got soda. Exactly. Oh, God. And, and so that was a little disheartening for me, but yeah. you know, it's just like, yeah. it's like, there was millions of dollars pumped into brainwashing these people. I'm just a, yeah. I'm just a guy who's just starting on a stevia, and nobody even really knows about it yet. So it wound up costing a shit ton of money. Wound up costing me a shit ton of money. Yeah, and it was right when the the economy uh, took a huge collapse. So I oh six Fannie Mae, all exactly, that shit. Exactly. Yeah, so I couldn't find investors, and you know I learned after I started the company oh you need about 10 million dollars to just if you're if you're starting Serious. your own company just you're, to get your brand out there like you need 10 million dollars like, I don't have fucking 10 million dollars to throw into yeah a fucking uh, company. A, a lemonade and, a lemonade and I couldn't find an and I couldn't find um, investors so eventually I closed it down yeah wow I had, to, I had to close it down but I still took my recipe and and went to a company and went oh do you guys want to use this so i'm like slightly behind the scenes still like like things that you'll see like in kroger or whole foods that are oh, like wow. juice related yeah yeah i'm behind a few of those things oh that's cool man yeah that's uh, that's uh, i'm glad you know i'm glad you you uh, to talk to people about you know diabetes because no, it's me too. just uh it's People think it's over when they get it. And I, I, I was scared. I was like, oh, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. I'm yeah. 50, you know, I was 50 years old when it happened. Yeah. And I was like, oh, what? I was afraid to eat. No. I was I, afraid I, to eat. I, I feel your pain, man. Yeah. At, at 29, I was going through the same thing. And then shooting this unbelievably dangerous medicine into your body that would give me such lows yeah i mean i remember like walking home for a rest from a restaurant my blood sugar went down to 25 whoa my legs started just giving out on me whoa and i'm uh, this is going up um going up beachwood canyon yeah. you've been in beachwood canyon oh, yeah i used to you, live there 13 okay, so years you know the diner yeah yeah beachwood right there on diner. the left so it's all closed down and i'm literally going i'm gonna die if i don't get sugar and i'm like it's like night of the living dead i'm like hobbling over the street and yeah. there's a guy in there just sweeping up and i'm knocking on the door i'm like Please give me some fucking sugar. I yeah. need fucking sugar. And the dude just looked at me and turned around like, "Who's this crazy son of a yeah, bitch gonna fucking yeah. you know get around?" Yeah. And uh, I forgot what happened. I think I didn't live too much further up from there, and I wound up getting some sugar. But that was like the scariest moment. You still live up there? No, I don't. I don't. You I know, actually, what I'm saying you used to. I used to live up there. Yeah. I think it's a magic neighborhood. I love that neighborhood. I do too. I miss I love it. That neighborhood. I miss it. Yeah. You're over in the valley now. No, I'm. Where are you? I'm right off of Sunset in the 405 literally right there um i have kids that go to go to a, a school in santa monica oh, yeah, yeah. so for so, me it's, yeah, all gotta, about, yeah. it's all about the you kids. got a new lady right over the I years did, um yeah it's been two years about juliette two years lewis now. yeah i you know uh i love her her music man uh, yeah she's great she's, she, uh, she's the iggy pop man of, right yeah she's a she's a dynamite dynamite of a woman just super talented and in music and in acting and everything. oh man at, at california Fun. natural born killers incredible oh she was incredible she was she was like my favorite man i mean yeah i remember when she came out i was just i remember thinking wow um she's sort of changing what like beauty was in hollywood or yeah like, you know like you're so just, right because it really it, cool. it was just more like like it, it was a different look and the talent was massive so, so fucking talented and uh, funny enough uh, Natural Born Killers was one of Rage's first uh, movie placements. Oh, that's and hilarious. And Oliver Stone hit us up 
there's a scene in the jail scene and it's a, a song called Take the Power Back. Yeah. And Oliver Stone hits up and is like, do you want to be a movie? And we were like, at the time, like, no, we don't want to be in a fucking Hollywood movie. And, and he was so pissed. He like, call our management company. He's like, he goes, you know what? Tell those motherfuckers, literally, tell those motherfuckers to come down to the Sony fucking screening yeah. at this time and just tell them to get their asses fucking down there. And they can watch the movie and then they can tell me afterwards that they don't want to be in the movie. Yeah. And I remember us all going down there and watching the movie and I was so blown away by that movie. It was what like, a film. It was just like uncomfortable and it had everything in like the, the, that I love in movies made you think. Oh my um, God. And I remember... Right after that movie, right after the screening ended, he's like, so what'd you think? And all of us are like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we, we, we'll be in that movie. No, <laughs> no, no problem, you're good. <laughs> it's like, those were the best placement, that movie, and then The Matrix was probably the best rage placement ever. So great, right? At the end of that movie, when it was Wake Up, the very end, and it was, I was really happy about both those. I can't thank you enough for doing it, man, doing the podcast today. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. Like, seriously, no bullshit, top five band for me ever. People always ask me. Also, I think that between Karen O and uh. Zach, there hasn't been a great front person so you know, besides the seventies, you know, and some early eighties guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, as you know, people people are always like, hey, "Who's your Who's the greatest ever?" And I'm like, "Oh, Bon Scott." Zach, they're like Zach. I go, yeah, dude. Every time the guy comes on, I'm. I don't know what it is about the band, but when it comes on, I'm ready. I'm smashing. You well, know, it's I love like, hearing that. It, it, there's not. That. It, there's nothing better than you guys' band live. Nothing better. Well, that's really uh, besides nice. Besides seeing like ACDC, you yeah. know, back in the day, man. The Kings. Or, the Kings, the man. Kings or of Ramones. The field you know, yeah, early oh, on. By the way, the Ramones' first record came out today, 1976. Wow. Today, yeah, we can celebrate that fucking great well thank you man so much and uh thanks so much and i'm looking forward to seeing uh prophets of rage i, I just had be real on i and, heard that yeah. yeah he was great yeah, man was and great. i love that living on the 110 oh thanks and, yeah and and chuck d chuck if you D's. want to talk about top five come on chuck d i've been trying to get him on this podcast for three years i saw really? Ch i saw chuck d on the fear of the black planet tour incredible no one uh, there Incredible. it is you, you know you go like zach chuck d bond scott you know yeah. what i mean i'm and i'm talking about people that are here rollins yeah you know yeah uh, uh, maynard dudes yeah. that are like what the fuck i'm talking original assassins on yeah. stage man man chuck uh, d chuck d, d being man. a man with chuck is, is burn hollywood trip. burn you that know voice like fucking is, fight the power that voice is oh. just so iconic and he's just like a father figure like he's, he's a god to me he has so much wisdom it's it's incredible i and gotta he, get him on you gotta get him on because he'll be telling a story and you'll think he's rambling and yeah. then he'll say something that ties it all together and you just go you're a fucking genius fear of the black planet and do the right thing spike lee's film yeah. the combination of that yeah. is one of the most monumental uh films ever made to me and still fucking relevant right now 2018 yep. today sadly the same dumb yeah. ass shits going on you know what i mean I agree uh, uh thank you so much and what, for what, me. what do you got coming up you got a, a tour right um yeah we leave for a tour at, at the i think june 22nd we do europe for about uh, two and a half weeks we come home and then we do an entire u.s tour with uh with avenge sevenfold oh yeah rad yeah rad. that's gonna be big. so i'll see you at the forum hopefully i'm going to it okay, okay will cool. you get me in yeah, of course i'll get yeah. you in tom was supposed to do this podcast four years ago this podcast six years old wow and, and it was going to be my i Iconic big guest at the wow. time. I was like, this is going to be the biggest guest, my favorite. Oh my yeah. God. He broke his foot. Wow. Some had me broke his foot and they and they go, he broke his foot. He'll reschedule. Never reschedule. Yeah, he's like, he broke his foot. He can't walk over here to, to and, do the. <laughs> but I see him at the improv when I'm doing comedy. That's I'm like, really dude, funny. man, I'm trying to reschedule. He's like, oh yeah. And he just fucking. That's really funny. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll put in a good word. This is actually my first podcast podcast i've ever done this is amazing don't so, do any more then I won't it looks do fucking amazing <laughs> <laughs> only, only this all right well thanks a lot for having me man. thank you man thank, and give me your uh, instagram real quick uh, my instagram is just brad wilk there you go just making sure everybody knows out there and get uh get some tickets to go see these guys live this summer see you guys thanks for tuning in